right, everybody. Thank you for showing up at 9.40 a.m. I know it's not easy. Um, so hopefully we're going to have some fun today. Um, we're going to be talking about incentives. First about a way in which I think uh, each incentive model is slightly broken um, and how we, we use that to create something that might actually be useful for users and gain some insight into the system. And then maybe about how to use incentives um, for, for other purposes. All right, so the first part of the talk is going to be about this uh, token that we've launched recently called Gas Token. And these slides are shamelessly stolen from my friend and uh, collaborator, Florian Trammer from Stanford University. And we are going to take a journey through blockchain resource arbitrage. So imagine if you're going to a Starbucks this morning. It's 9.40 AM. You want to wake up. You want to have your coffee. And today it's Monday. So you're going to have $4 for the cappuccino. And you're paying with Bitcoin. So the transaction fee is cheap at only 10 cents. But then the next day on Friday, it's $4 for the cappuccino. And the transaction fee is $6.25. Would this be like a nice way to run a payment system? And uh, also think about it from the perspective of the coffee shop, who's a business that's handling a bunch of these transactions every day. Is this the way they want to be pricing their customers? So this is actually similar to the way Ethereum works today with this gas market. Uh, in Ethereum, when you submit a transaction, each transaction will use a certain amount of gas. And uh, each user who's submitting a transaction provides a gas price that they are willing to pay per unit of gas in Ether to the miner. These gas prices, even when denominated in Ether, as this graph does, and not in US dollars, uh, are insanely volatile. So they're volatile not only in US dollar terms, but also against Ether. Uh, they're prone to huge spikes when the network is congested. And they're also prone to being sort of very low in the periods of, uh, of non-congestion and much higher when there's a fee market that forms in a sort of auction dynamic that comes about in the system. Uh, so right here is actually when the, the CryptoKitties game came out. You can kind of pinpoint the effect on Ethereum transaction gas. Uh, I think it did like a 50x or something like that after CryptoKitties came out. Uh, and this is not unique to Ethereum. Any large cryptocurrency that has substantial demand sees these problems. So here's the graph in, in Bitcoin. You can see actually the fluctuations are much more severe in, uh, than in Ethereum, going from almost zero fees to $60 uh, fees at the peak of congestion this year. So how do ordinary businesses handle volatility in the real world? Well, generally, you either stock up when prices are low and acceptable to you, or if you don't have a physical warehouse where you can maybe store the oil and the other resources that your businesses need to survive, you buy financial instruments that are sort of derivatives of these underlyings. Uh, and there's a, a rich industry and a rich market that's come around these uh, derivatives and other instruments including the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is sort of the American center for this kind of activity. Um, and these services do provide value to businesses that, say, depend on the price of resources and want that to be predictable rather than unpredictable when they're planning investments or something like that. Um, but how do you do this in ETH? There's no way to actually buy gas. There's no way to hold gas. There's no way to buy a gas future. There is no way to speculate or stockpile transaction fees. And even deeper, what are the actual resources that we're talking about here? So what are the resources that people are paying for when they submit a transaction to a bank? Um, so gas token is, is one very crude attempt to begin to answer this question. And it's a token that allows you to stockpile and trade Ethereum gas. So when you hold one gas token, you're essentially holding on to some quantity of gas in the Ethereum system. Uh, this is joint work between myself, Lawrence Breidenbach at ETH Zurich, uh, Florian Traumer at Stanford, and advised by Ari Jules at Cornell. So in a nutshell, the way gas token works is it takes advantage of this property of Ethereum's mechanism, crypto economic pricing mechanism called the gas refund, uh, which offers you a refund for either releasing contract storage, so deleting something that was previously stored in contract state, or destroying contracts. So if you have a contract that's being stored by all the nodes and you run a self-destruct operation, the user will receive some gas refund. This was originally intended to incentivize people to do the right thing and clean up after themselves. So destroy your contracts and clean up your storage if necessary to avoid bloating the system and making people store your sort of profit forever. Um, unfortunately, how many people in this room have developed a smart contract? 
how many people have included a functionality for cleaning up storage or contracts later uh, using either self-destruct or s store zero? Wow, that's, that's actually more than I expected. Um, so generally, if you look at contracts on the network, a lot of people aren't taking advantage of this refund uh, because it's too, maybe too small and too difficult to claim to be uh, significant. But it does sort of allow us to create this gas token uh, instrument. So the way gas token works is that when gas price is low, it stores things in the Ethereum state. You can think of it as just writing ones to the state when gas is low, uh, or it creates contracts. So there are two different versions of gas tokens. We'll talk about that in a sec. And when gas price is high, it deletes this state and claims the refund. Um, now, because the refund is denominated in gas, this refund happens at the higher gas price and is worth more ether than was, uh, was essentially spent to uh, originally pay for the gas. Um, so this isn't a way for users to make money because you don't actually get refunded ether. You just get a discount on future transactions. But this is a way for people who are doing super high gas transactions to save money. Um, so often when you have an ICO or you have a decentralized exchange, you have actors front running the system, um, you have this sort of bidding war on gas where people compete on how high they can get gas and how, how quickly they can get included into a miner's block. Uh, we've seen this with some ICOs where people have paid up to $600,000 in gas fees on a single transaction. Um, and we've also seen this in practice with Ether Delta arbitrage, for example, where there's a market of many, many arbitragers who bid up the gas um, sort of up until the point where it's no longer profitable. So for these kinds of uses, it's absolutely uh, profitable to do this scheme. And the refund can pay for up to half of your transaction fee. This is just kind of a property of the system. So an example. So uh, oh, this animation got messed up. Um, so uh, when gas is low, let's say the regular gas price on ETH gas station is one way. You store 10 words of storage, which costs you 200,000 gas, and let's say around 20 cents. Um, when gas is high, let's say 40 way, or you want to do a juicy transaction to buy into an ICO or front run someone, you free, the, you free those 10 words you stored earlier and also do whatever else you wanted, like let's say breed your kitty. Um, and then you get this, this refund of, two, of uh, 125,000 gas, half of this transaction, but you get it at this higher 40 way gas price instead of at the one way that you bought it at. So really the value that you're saving on this transaction is $9 for the original expenditure of 20 cents. Um, so there's two different variants of gas token that we've created. There's gas token one, GST one, and this uses storage, so contract storage, uh, as in like the state. Um, and there's also GST two, which uses creation and deletion of contracts. Um, they have different efficiency profiles. GST two is more complex, but also more efficient. Uh, the ratio between the price you pay and the refund is slightly more favorable. Um, it actually gets interesting. So uh, over here, we have the sort of maximal savings and efficiency each token can achieve on the y-axis. So uh, 2.0 here means you're saving twice as much as, uh, as you're putting in, in terms of gas, not in terms of ether. Um, and uh, this is the ratio between the high and the low gas price. So this is when sort of the schemes are profitable to use. And you can see that actually, in general, the GST2 scheme is much more efficient than the GST1 scheme. This curve is sort of higher. But there's an interesting region here when gas prices fluctuate between 1 and 1.4 times when GST1 is actually more efficient. Um, if you're interested in the full details of why, they're, they're on the website. Uh, but th there's kind of an interesting question here of whether gas token 2 over the long term can stabilize gas prices by causing people to try to do this arbitrage when gas is cheap and uh, release gas when gas is expensive, thereby sort of coming up with a constant price uh, for, for a day that doesn't depend on the demand of the network as strongly. So if this does happen and the fluctuations of gas become small enough, it actually is possible that GST will be the only profitable uh, form of gas token. All right, question, who pays for the refund? So this is kind of uh, one way of looking at it, which is that the miner is only being paid for, for half the transaction uh, cost. This is technically true because the miner would have been paid twice as much had you not used gas token. But really, more than just this, uh, this person is paying for it. The whole network pays for it because you do have to store the storage over the long term. Uh, all nodes have to store the storage. The nodes are generally not getting paid to store the storage. Um, and also, all nodes potentially have to process more computation in a given block than the gas limit of that block, which is kind of undesirable from a scaling point of view. Um, so everyone is really paying for this refund. And this illustrates sort of a, a 
problem with its incentive model that I think is much more widespread than just this specific case, um, which is that there are a lot of different parts of the system that are currently relying on commons and altruistic style models rather than being strongly incentive, compa in strongly incentive compatible and ensuring that uh, economically rational actors are going to do the right thing. Uh, so this is a problem. Um, I think there need to be solutions. And to find these solutions, we need to think deeply about what is actually being priced here and who's bearing the cost. So we need to relook at the cost of full nodes, uh, the cost of things like light client services, the cost of uh, storage, computation, and network, the various physical resources that we think are being exchanged. And we need more efficient and better ways to price these uh, that are sustainable in the long term, because the current model probably does not. So why wouldn't miners blacklist gas token? Well, two reasons. Uh, Ethereum is naturally censorship resistant, so any soft forks open the miners up to DOS attacks. You can just create a bunch of expensive looking transactions that will never actually validate and like use that as an amplification vector to uh, flood miners. Um, gas token can also increase transaction demand when gas prices are low, so it's not clear that it's necessarily as much of a net loss to the miners as it looks initially. Um, so is gas token an investment vehicle, security, financial product? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I would not buy this thing. Uh, it is an interesting mechanism that I think could be useful for some power users, but uh, it's likely that the developers of gas token, including me, are going to and have been advocating for changes in the network that make gas token. So one of my favorite network changes to advocate for is storage rent, um, which sort of uh, neuters this whole scheme, uh, where users actually also have to pay for the time value of storage, as well as an upfront sort of small cost to get storage in the first place. Um, so this comes to the sort of deeper issue with storage pricing that we're talking about here, which is that blockchain state is permanent. So blockchain state can be smart contract storage, it can be in Bitcoin, the UTXO set, et cetera. This is not, absolutely not a problem that's uh, specific to Ethereum. Uh, other systems like Bitcoin have a much simpler resource model, so maybe they haven't quite hit the limits of it yet and they haven't started noticing these same issues. But there are questions coming up around UTXO set management and UTXO pruning in Bitcoin that are, that are very similar to this. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't assume that this is an Ethereum or even smart contract uh, or specific problem. And uh, another deep problem here is that a one-time transaction fee is a recurring and indefinite cost to the network. So we should make writing to state more expensive. Users are not going to like this because it's going to increase the cost of operating contracts, but it needs to be done because it's far too cheap to do right now. I believe we've, we bought around, uh, my numbers might be off here, so take this as an off the top estimate, but like around 3,000 blocks worth of Ethereum space for around $25,000 in terms of accumulating gas tokens. And that was right after CryptoKitties when the gas prices were like five to 10 times what they are now. Um, so you can probably pick up like Ethereum full blocks for like dollars a um, day, which is way too cheap. We also need to incentivize users to clean up better. So Bitcoin, uh, while it doesn't have this, this sort of arbitrage issue that gas token exploits, um, it does have this UTXO set where no one's ever incentivized to combine or prune their UTXOs. Um, except when fees are like ridiculously high, by which point it's too late. So it has very similar incentive issues. It just uh, chooses a different side. Of that, you know. um, so yeah, again, one solution to this is storage rent. There are a few EIPs out there. I think there are some new proposals on ETH research that are uh, even more interesting than these EIPs. And I'd love to talk to people about how to make usable abstractions for this for developers. Um, it is tricky to execute. Uh, contracts suddenly can start disappearing. This sort of messes with people's whole mental model of the system and the guarantees that these systems have been providing in a way that maybe even threatens their, their market viability in the long term. Um, so if a new system comes along and says, we don't care about being sustainable, but we're the old Ethereum and we're going to give you contracts forever, there's a very real risk that users could prefer that model. Um, so we have to be careful in how we introduce this, and it has to be seamless to developers. But I think that at least I am convinced, um, I don't know about the rest of the I'm convinced that in the long term, to be incentive compatible, there does need to be some sort of uh, time cost. So this is why uh, we started this project called Project Chicago, which aims to study crypto commodities, which are what we're calling these blockchain resources of uh, computation, network, and storage. Uh, so you can visit the projectchicago.io. For some reason, I didn't put the URL on there. Um, and 
the question that we're looking at is how do we accurately price and enable free trade of these resources in a way that gives users the best possible price while making sure the system is robust going forward and that everyone is getting paid according to the cost they're actually incurring. Um, beyond gas token, so one thing we're looking at, uh, this is an outline for an Oracle-based uh, derivatives contract for Bitcoin fees. So again, we said none of this stuff is unique to Ethereum. Um, the thesis of Project Chicago is that no matter what system you have and how the market is structured for these resources, you're going to have secondary arbitrage markets that exploit these inefficiencies at large enough scale. Um, so an example of this would be this sort of options contract for Bitcoin uh, average fees, which is something we're actually building in Ethereum as an ERC721. So there's going to be an ERC721 token that you can buy uh, to sort of have an option on the future fees in the Bitcoin network. And you know, if you're a business like Coinbase that's doing like thousands of transactions or the future businesses that people want to build in these systems that need to be doing thousands of transactions for their users and don't want to be crippled by like, let's say a 100x spike in transaction fees as Coinbase was when this happened in Bitcoin uh, a few months ago. Um, these kinds of instruments are going to be necessary. Uh, not only for transaction fees, but also for other resources like hash power. So if you're a miner and you want to hedge against hash power increases when you're setting up an operation, that's also something that we want to enable to have a more efficient uh, hash power. So gastoken.io and projectchicago.io have more info about those uh, projects. All right, one last quick thing I'm gonna talk about, and that is uh, new incentives uh, that smart contracts provide for the security community. So this is sort of a new topic. Um, here we're gonna be exploring like, what do smart contracts bring to the security community that's new and innovative? This is a point that I wanted to make in my presentation yesterday, but uh, I didn't have time to, so we're kind of switching gears a little bit. Uh, so what's really cool about smart contracts for the security community? We look at this page all the time, but there's this hidden thing in here that's actually really, really valuable when you're designing, designing secure systems. And that's this exact balance of how much the contract is worth. Uh, that gives you the exact value to an attacker that a contract would be worth to attack, uh, approximately, in some model, and also gives you a, sort of the, an estimate of the security level required for the contract. So this contract with 0.0000048 ether probably doesn't need a lot of security. Um, so this is why we're, uh, so this is one thing we leverage in announcing this Hydra project, which I suggest you check out at the hydra.io. Uh, which aims to create decentralized security and bug bounties and bring these rigorous guarantees sort of to the contract level. Um, uh, it's one of the first uh, rigorous crypto economic analyses at the contract level, asking the question of how much security does a given piece of code, does a given contract have. And it also allows you to do these trust-minimized, decentralized on-chain bounties without any human arbitration required, without any subjectivity in the payment without any trust required to like trust the person to pay you or say it was a valid bug or whatever. Um, it's based on this old 80s idea of N version programming. I'm happy to discuss with you how it's different from standard N version programming. But the basic idea here is uh, developers develop many copies of their contract independently. They use different languages, different compilers, uh, different tool chains to develop this to isolate themselves from bugs um, in, in sort of individual components. And then every time a contract runs on chain, every time a user provides some X input, uh, our Hydra hypervisor actually runs all of the smart contracts, check that they all return the same output, and then returns that output. If they don't, then it pays whoever, uh, whoever uh, provided this X a bounty. So this is one way of achieving these trust minimized uh, bounties in a programmatic way. Uh, there are also schemes that you can do to deal with external calls. So when there is an external call, we have the Hydra uh, contract sort of multiplex it and cache the result, feed it to the heads, sort of beyond the scope of this talk. But it's interesting because we have launched a bounty on the Ethereum mainnet worth $2,600 for users. So you can go today and try to crack our ERC-20, which is composed of four different independently developed versions. Uh, and we're going to be announcing more soon. For this project. So. Uh, yeah, thank you to, uh, I guess, obligatory plugs, same ones I gave yesterday. Uh, check out the Hydra on the hydra.io. Um, check out Runtime Verification, which is another company I advise. Thank you to our industry sponsors at IC3 and obligatory disclaimers. Thank you.
What's up, everyone? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the show. My name is Ethan Buckman. I lead the Tenement and Cosmos development teams. Uh, and today I wanted to pitch you a grand narrative I've been working on that I call A Brief History of Distributed State. Um, this is, this is kind of one of these very high level uh, epics, you might say, about the history of humankind, where we've come from, where we're going, what's next, and so on. Um, but, but done in a way that I promise will tie into uh, the technology we're working on. So, before I do that, though, let me just ask you, how many of you actually already know about Cosmos? All right, basically everyone. And Tendermint? Also basically everyone. So, so no one was expecting me to give you like any technical details about how either of those things work, right? Is that right? Do you want technical details about how those things work? Yeah, so I, so I should do that instead of this talk? Um, maybe, we'll see. Maybe we'll, get, we'll get into some of that at the end. We'll, we'll see how long it takes. Um, awesome. So thank you all for coming out early morning. Uh, and let's get started. Problem, distributed state. This is, this is what I spent all my time thinking about. And this isn't some ad hoc esoteric problem that is only of concern to computer scientists or to blockchain geeks or people in this room. Um, this, is, this is the fundamental problem in complex organized systems. This is the thing that is responsible for our ability to understand each other, to self-organize, to agree on a time and a place to meet, to see a conference on the history of distributed state on a Friday morning, right? If it weren't for the fact that we shared, that there was a, a state machine replicated across all of us that allowed us to understand the English language, it wouldn't be possible to communicate, right? So distributed state is really the, the, the fundamental basic problem to human social organization, to biological organization, to the, the very essence and being of an organism, and of course, today, to distributed systems, to, to digital distributed systems, right? And what I've, what I've noticed in thinking about this stuff is that there are, there are very strong analogies in the history of the evolution of human organizations and the history of the evolution of digital networks. And so the goal of this talk is to kind of paint uh, those two parallel trajectories and, and show those analogies and show how those streams are actually starting to converge around now in the kinds of things we're all working on in the decentralization of political unions, uh, in the development of much more local um, cultures and economics, and of course in the, the scaling problems that are now currently facing uh, blockchain systems. So I should just say, uh, before I dive into that, my background is actually in um, biophysics. You, you may have guessed that or discovered that from ever talking to me, uh, and, and that is because very early on, I kind of identified the same problem, and the most interesting place I saw to study it was, was inside the cell, right? Because inside the cell, you have this amazing cacophony of, of proteins and large molecules and DNA and, and cytoskeletal features and, and all this stuff kind of jostling together to do this dance that is life, right? And across that entire uh, repertoire of, of molecules and organized complexity, there is extremely rich, stateful information about the external world, right? And, and it's because of that, it's because the cell is able to maintain so much information internally about the external world that it's able to adapt and respond and, and survive, right? And, and maintain kind of a, a sustainable essence. And part of the, the, you know, one of the most fundamental things a cell does is it divides, it splits in half, right? It forks, right? And so when, when we think about, you know, blockchain governance, blockchain scalability, and, and the, the splits that happen in our communities and the problem of forking, it may be the case that we've kind of come at it slightly from the wrong, with, with the wrong lens, right? Maybe, maybe forks and a proliferation of them aren't such a bad thing if we have a larger framework in which to understand them, if the forks are kind of happening in a you know, more controlled, mitotic manner, right? And so I don't think we're anywhere near figuring out what that looks like quite yet. And I don't even think, and, and this is part of, part of the essence of my philosophy, I don't even think we can act adequately design that, right? Just like no one, could have adequately designed you know, the cell itself. No, no engineer can do that. No engineer can actually understand everything that's going on there in a way that they could design it from scratch. Some people might want to disagree. If you disagree, come, uh, come fight me after. 
<laughs> the, the point being, though, that the way, the way the cell ultimately works is it has some, some common set of low-level primitives that all cells use, right? These are the, the basic structural features of DNA, the, the ATP energy molecule, right? Basic ideas around uh, structure, functionality, relationships in, in protein, right? So these, these basic, simple primitives allow this massively diverse set of state machines, ultimately, to operate in biological organisms that all have, you know, they do their own things, completely different things. Some of us make certain kinds of fibers, others make other ridiculous kinds of fibers. Some people, some organisms make slime, some organisms don't, they make other kinds of, you know, wasted materials, whatever. But it's all happening with the same set of primitives, right? And, and you can think about what's going on in each cell, in a sense, as a state machine, a distributed state machine, operating on this information that comes into the cell, right? And, screening things back out and doing stuff with it and, and using that state to kind of coordinate and, and to stay organized, right? And so this is really the problem that, that has fascinated me my whole life. And when I saw, you know, when, when Bitcoin showed up on my radar, and at first I didn't understand it, and then I kind of dug a little deeper, it struck me that, that this was the same problem happening and the, the same phenomenon happening now in the digital medium that I had been looking at in the biophysical medium, right? And, and I was floored by that because it never, I never had really thought about that kind of capacity of the internet in the same way, but you know, obviously the internet is this amazing way for information to, to disseminate, right? But I, I hadn't really been struck by the, the actual organizational capacity of the internet uh, in, in the way that it might be able to facilitate um, amazing higher level complexity the way organisms do, right? And ever since I started thinking about it, I haven't been able to, to go back. And so kind of out of that train of thought has emerged this, this history I'm gonna paint of kind of the analogy between the evolution of, of complexity and organization in human systems and the same thing in digital networks, right? And so that's what we're going to go into now. Y'all with me? In the beginning, villages and city-states. So this is where we started, you know. Uh, maybe maybe 10,000 years ago, every human society was up to something like this. And starting maybe 5,000 years ago or so, it started to look like that, right? But it, but it's more or less the same kind of um, the, the same kind of level of organization in the sense that there's significant isolation. There's a very strong sense of self-sufficiency. Not just a sense of self-sufficiency. There is a very strong element of self-sufficiency that sustains these kinds of organizations. They don't have large-scale inputs from the outside, right? If they can't coordinate with each other well enough to produce everything they need to survive, they're out. You know, the the tigers are coming or or whatever. Um, and so. In these societies, you have, you have this incredibly high self-sufficiency. You have roughly everyone more or less knowing everyone else, right? And they're, they're, they're coordinating on this very small scale um, to provide just what they need with almost no input from the outside and no exports to the outside, right? So this is kind of where we start. And within each of these societies, there is obviously a uh, distributed state problem. There's a state machine operating across all of the people in the society that informs them how they should behave in the world, how they should interact with each other, what their local customs are, what their uh, religious practices are, what certain things mean when, when rain doesn't fall for a few days, what is the implication of that, and what do you have to do to get the state machine going again to bring you some rain, right? Um, and of course, they have a common language, right? And, 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 sa and same with the city-state. Um, but it's all very, very local, attuned to your, your local conditions and customs, and it would be radically different from um, other villages or other states that aren't that far away, right? Even if they're speaking similar languages, they end up having uh, very different customs or very different uh, kinds of gods or, or, or whatever, right? And so a lot of the chaos of, of human history has kind of come down to the violent collisions between relatively close, closely localized communities that kind of just don't understand each other. Their, their state machines, in a sense, don't clip, right? And we see the same thing kind of happening today in the blockchain community where you have these gliding state machines, gliding communities, um, not clicking, and, and I'm hoping we can do something about that. So, so anyways, th this is where we start on, on the human side of things. On the, on the digital network side of things, it looks something like this. We have uh, you know, personal computers, not really plugged into an internet, kind of self-sufficient, doing their own thing, no access to the outside world, not really exporting anything, doing some word processing, playing some games, whatever, right? Very nice, controlled, understandable state machine. Uh, and, and you can think of an intranet as maybe kind of the same thing. It's a little bit uh, of an expanded version of this. You take a bunch of these, put them together. It's like you take a bunch of villages, put them together, you get a city-state, right? So same kind of self-enclosed system. And, and, and this is where we start. But of course, very rapidly, 
um, things start to expand and you start to get the idea, well, you can connect computers into an intranet, maybe you can connect intranets into an internet, right? And same thing with, um, with city states, like, well, if you, if you coalesce villages into a city state, why don't you start connecting city states into some larger entity, right? It's a very natural kind of thing to think. So, so what happens next? We move into the era of empires, right? And I like to call the area of empires the area of somebody else's government, right? Because, because this is what started to happen. You're minding your business, you're in your little village, you're in your little city state, and down comes Alexander the Great with his massive army from Macedonia and his ridiculous customs that you've never seen before. And he's stomping through your city and telling you, okay, now we're in charge, right? And it's a really interesting predicament to be a, a city recently conquered by, by Alexander because it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, he's offering you, uh, he's offering you protection from all the barbarians in the, in the vicinity that aren't part of the empire, right? So, uh, but on the other hand, you have to pay taxes, you have to be subservient to him, you maybe have to adopt some of his gods, whatever, right? So, so there's that, there's that double-edged sword of kind of accepting much less responsibility yourself. You no longer have to worry as much about being self-sufficient, all this kind of stuff. You can, you can trade with the rest of the empire, so if you can't produce enough locally, you know, Alexander's uh, routes will allow you to, to ship something from some other domain, um, but you give up sovereignty. Right? A significant amount of sovereignty, because now, if Alexander is trying to fight a war off in Western Africa, he might ship your children off to go fight it on his behalf. Right? So you lose a lot of the autonomy that you had when you were just your own city-state that was kind of a, a familial, familial thing. Right? Alexander, fortunately, was actually quite benevolent. Right? He let people continue to practice their own religion, and continue to have some of that autonomy and sovereignty, though they still had to give up significant elements. They had to fight his army, and they had to pay taxes, and Right? So this era, I mean, Alexander's empire you know, didn't last that long. He died young. But the same kind of thing uh, continued on for another 1,500 years, if not more, right? basically up until the uh, French Revolution, you might say. But in the digital network world, the somebody else's government, the age of empires, looks something like this, somebody else's computers. Right? Everyone know who this figure is? Yeah? Mr. Bezos? So, so this guy is the Alexander the Great of our times, right? The benevolent dictator who is slowly, if you haven't noticed, actually literally conquering the world, right? With, with physical locations everywhere and co-opting cities everywhere he goes into his empire, right? And it's, it's an amazing, the same trade-off is present. It's like this guy waltzes in, says we're gonna bring all these jobs to your city, but now you are a, uh, you, you know, you're a sub-state of the Amazonian empire, effectively, right? And if you're, if you're a, uh, if you're a small internet company and you have uh, and you were used to be running your own data centers and doing kind of your own servers and doing everything yourself, right? There's a lot of cost. There's a lot of autonomy. And then he comes around and says, "Hey, just just load it all up onto the cloud and we'll do everything for you, right? But so we'll make everything easier. But now we control your data. We control your uptime. We control the censorship and so on, right? So it's that same kind of trade-off that the small city-states face when Alexander come in. Small companies or even large companies and even cities now are facing when when Jeff Bezos comes." And it's, the fascinating thing to me is that there's this, there's this huge impetus to do this, right? Because from, from Jeff's perspective, it's, in, it's incredibly efficient. If only the whole world were under the Amazonian empire, then there'd be no friction, right? Everyone, you'd just be able to get whatever you want, whatever you want, and everything would just be like great and glorious, right? Allegedly. Um, but, but obviously that's not actually the case because an empire as big as Amazon's or as big as Alexander the Great's is, is too big, it's too large. It's too geopolitically diverse to actually effectively govern, right? It's such a complex society as, as ours. And, and even back then, um, you know, the, all the, the big empires have collapsed for this very reason. So, <clears throat> as these empires grow, they, they all start to face this problem of the, the world, the underlying demographic, the citizenry of the empire is too complex and too diverse to be well represented by something with such large reach, right? And, and then you end up finding these, these massive disconnects. Like, like Jeff made some ridiculous statement um, the other day. He was like, oh, I don't know how best, best to help humanity, so I'm gonna cash out a billion dollars a year to build spaceships. There's like a lot of people in this room who are like, yeah, yeah, this, you know, this is a good way to help humanity. And, and maybe you're right. But meanwhile, he's, he's, he's battling the city of Seattle to pay less taxes because the rents are going up and no one can afford a home, right? So if like, you want to help humanity, there are humans on the ground here right now, you know, but, but you, can't, you can't even see them because your empire is so damn big. It's practically interplanetary, almost literally, right? So this is, this is obviously not sustainable. It, it, it can't work in the long term. 
And so as these empires grew to these, to these massive scales, right, eventually they start to fracture. The citizenry is too diverse, it's too complex to be well represented by a common thing, right? So what happens next? Sovereign nations. So, you know, beginning roughly with the French Revolution and then the American Revolution and then everyone else has pretty much followed suit. We now have large geopolitical sovereignty that is relatively independent. Each country gets to have its own currency, it can have its own language if it wants. Uh, most of us chose bastardized German for whatever reason. It can have, uh, you know, its own, its own kind of culture if it decides to, right? Um, that kind of represents history or represents something about how they came to independence. And, and it's very powerful, right? And you have a, a, new, a new agreement on the state machine that operates in this organization, right? So in, in, the, in the distributed system we call Canada, there is a set of laws and there are a set of bodies that enforce those laws and everyone is more, and there are a set of languages that people are expected to speak and understand and everyone participating is complying with that state machine. They, they speak English or in some places they speak bastardized French. Um, they, they adhere to the court systems. Uh, they follow the laws and so on. And the laws slightly vary across every country, right? Okay. The same thing is happening on the digital network space, right? The Amazonian empire is getting too big. The people are getting restless underneath. And they're saying, you know what? Let's break out of this empire. Let's, let's develop our own sovereign digital network systems, right? And so we see the emergence of, of new networks that represent distinct kinds of cultures and communities and constitutions. Bitcoin is this like libertarian sound money thing. Ethereum is this, this big experiment in, in distributed state machines. Dogecoin is a testament to the power of like silliness to bring people together and so on, right? And, and each of these kind of sits independently of, of each other one. They don't really have the strongest of, of connections between them. And they, they speak their own language, they have their own standards. And there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of communication between, between the larger communities. Right? That's large scale. But by and large, they're, they're kind of operating on their own. Right? But none of them are really self-sufficient. Just like sorry, none of these countries are, are actually self-sufficient. Right? What's happened in the collapse of the empires is that these nation states sprung up that became completely dependent on this complex web of interconnections across all of them to sustain them all. Right? And so as much as we regained some kind of abstract sovereignty, we actually lost the, the autonomy and the sovereignty that, that would actually sustain us. So if all of those connections broke down, if the global supply chain and all the you know, inter, international um, relationships broke down, we would all be screwed because there isn't, there's literally not enough food in the city to feed people, right? Uh, it, it's a little bit harder to bridge that analogy here. I mean, Bitcoin and Ethereum aren't, aren't feeding people, they're buying them Lamborghinis, so you can't eat your Lamborghini, some of you might discover that. Um, but, but it, it, it's kind of relevant because none of these have actually made any connection to the real world except for wasting electricity. That's all they do, right? It, this, literally, that's all they do. It's like who can, waste, who can waste the most electricity the fastest, right? And so, okay, running out of time, so I have to, <laughs> I have to jump ahead. But the, the point I want to make again is that just like in the Age of Empires, um, in this age of geopolitical unions or large digital network sovereigns, the, the customer base, the citizenry, again, is still too large and diverse and complex. These single large scale political unions can't adequately represent the underlying complexity of the society, right? And so they're gonna be doomed to fail in the same way that the empires were doomed to fail. So what's coming next? Well, I would argue that we're actually moving back into something like an era of villages and city states all over except it's more like an era of eco-villages and metropolises, right? There's a, a huge resurgence of interest in, in local farming, in local communities, in alternative economics, um, in this whole like act local, think global kind of philosophy. And similarly, more people than ever live in cities and people are far more likely to identify with their cities than they are with their, their nation state, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's huge gulfs in a country like even Canada or America between any of the different cities, right? And people in one city have a very different culture than, than people in another. And so, arguably, the city in the eco-village is a much more uh, sustainable and robust foundation for, for globalization and for, for global commerce than the nation states are because the governance of these entities can be much more representative of their constituents. Right? And I think this is kind of obvious and everyone knows this and you know, everyone that's involved in blockchain is very much interested in this decentralization kind of things. Right? But for some reason, 
we don't seem to really be applying it yet to our digital networks. These guys are still large scale nation states. And we haven't really started to think about what it would mean to break them down into a, a collection or a cooperative of city states, right? And so this is one of the main things that we're proposing with Cosmos. One of the reasons I'm so interested in working on the Cosmos network is because it starts to provide a way to think about this problem. To think about the convergence now between the organization of, of human societies and the organization of digital networks converging in a common way so that this latest stage of digital network organization can actually match and reflect this latest stage of social organization where we have local communities, cities that are running relatively autonomously and self-sufficiently using digital infrastructure that they're hosting themselves, right? And that is enabling them um, to, to govern and, and, to, and to reflect in their, digital, in their digital networks what is happening in the real world, right? Um, unfortunately, I am out of time. This is the reason I got into the blockchain space, is to work on local currencies and representing real world value uh, in digital networks in a way that is actually reflective of, of the people and their, and their commercial interactions and personal interactions and so on. And I think we're getting to a point where um, this is starting to get very real and this kind of convergence is actually important both for the scalability of, of our political structures and for the scalability of our digital network structures, blockchain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's welcome our next speaker, Brian Eisenbach. Uh, we basically ripped directly from Python. 
Um, one of Python's principles is to literally borrow whatever makes sense, so we borrow from Python. Um, it's also to make it as simple as and intuitive as possible so you can write things that are easy to understand. Uh, so if you want to do one thing, writing secure smart contracts, and we want to do it very well. This may come at the expense of performance, and that's okay. You can optimize that later by adding an optimization routine to the code. We recognize gas usage is currently a problem with Viper, but using a lot of gas is a lot better than losing a lot of money. Uh, a few other Pythonic principles uh, we rip off, but most importantly, readability over writability is what ensures uh, secure design or auditing over hacking. Our features reflect this. So uh, we disallowed operator and function overloading. Uh, that way you know exactly what you're looking at is and does based by what it's called. Uh, we don't have modifiers. Modifiers can hard hide intent, make it harder to follow what's going on. Usually, some, it's basically usually just some type of assert on a specific address or access right, so just write it out in the function. Um, and if you have something that's a little bit more complex, like checking for membership in a set, just write a small function to do that and assert that is a little bit more cool. Um, we don't have variable size data structures. Uh, this eliminates some gas attack vectors that are possible. And, uh, it allows us to actually explicitly estimate the use of gas when we compile, so you know exactly how much it's going to be used before you even, uh, before you even call it. We force function visibility because explicit is better than implicit. Uh, that, that was one of the uh, attacks in the parity of multi uh, sig wallet. And we disallow single recursion and min mitigate mutual recursion, which minimizes re entry and single attacks. We have support for built-in uh, fixed-point decimal types. Um, this is in pure decimal representation, not binary uh, coded decimal. Um, so this doesn't give us any uh, precision errors when we're uh, using that type. We have support for labeled units. Um, we have a few right now. Uh, they're basically labeled integers. They're integers that can only interact with other integers of the same label. So you can uh, isolate things like way value from working with something else unless you implicitly convert. Units are also handled mathematically. If you have some sort of conversion factor, you know, way to a uh, currency unit, you can ensure that you're not mixing your, your types when you're doing the math. We're adding support to support arbitrary units when you're defining, um, when you're defining your, your variables in your function. Uh, so look out for that in the future. Uh, we have built-in overflow protection. Everything is basically safe math. Um, so uh, it'll throw in violation of an overflow and underflow um, condition. We don't allow inline assembly because that's probably the easiest way to confuse someone uh, if they're reading your contract. So if you need something uh, specific, we added a few things uh, like EC recover. Uh, we can build it into our language as that you can leverage. We don't allow inheritance. Um, namespace pollution cause, can create a lot of problems when understanding, um, when understanding your contract, and it also kind of hides and isolates different functionality among different files with reason to follow in an audit scenario. Um, this also means everything is in one file, so you can upload an either scan just you know, as it is, and that's pretty cool. Uh, we're exploring composition as an extensional approach, uh, basically creating specific types you can load in that you know what they do, and you know how they interact, so you don't run into a scenario where you're overloading a specific class, and then you've broken something by overloading it. But what does it look like beneath the hood? So I'm going to do a little bit of a walkthrough of uh, the construction of the compiler. So the front end, or the first stage of our compiler, actually uses Python leverage the AST module, which is a, uh, Python's front end that uh, parses and creates the abstract syntax tree for, for a Python program. And thanks to type annotations, which is a new feature Python added in 3.5, we can actually create a statically typed language that was originally meant to uh, using the parser for a dynamic language, which is kind of created. Here's a, the example we're going to be using today. Uh, just a little short thing that allows you to add two 
integers together. And uh, so the first step of the process is to parse the AST from Python into our uh, LLL intermediate representation for the next stage. Uh, an AST, if, if you're not familiar, looks kind of like this thing on the right. It's basically a tree that uh, puts down all the different operators and creates a hierarchy of how things look. A little aside about our intermediate representation, or IR. Uh, I don't actually know what triple L stands for, but I think Lisp-like language is the closest thing um, because we're implementing the Lisp in Python using Python lists. Uh, to my knowledge, no other EVM language uses LL, uh, triple L's, it's IR. We're exploring uh, some of the other uh, IRs like Solidities in order to create a kind of common uh, intermediate representation so we can deduplicate some of these efforts. Um, it has several macro routines we use inside of our compiler, but it's mostly a translation to this lower level uh, scenario. The one big thing it doesn't have is types. Everything is an unsigned 26 integer. Uh, so our conversion process is mostly about uh, converting the, uh, each type to how it would uh, look as a unit 256. The reason why you use an IR is to enable optimizations that can reduce inefficiencies in your design. So here's an example in triple L for your reference. Notice it's a lot bigger than our previous example but it calls out opcodes directly and uh, loads in specific memory uh, locations. Um, so we do optimizations at this layer. We do simple things that are, uh, are uh, must satisfy two properties in order, to be, uh, in order to be a successful optimization. You cannot alter the intent of the program and it cannot be more expensive than the original. So constant <laughs> folding is a really good uh, example of this. Addition and subtraction are associated with operations. That means when you combine two numbers into one, you're not really losing information in the program. It's doing the exact same thing as what it, sh it should be doing in the original program. Uh, but there are less operations occurring. There's less opcodes being called. So gases stay by doing this operation. Um, here's what it looks like in practice. Oh. Uh, yeah, so here's what it looks like in practice. You know, we take the three operations and reduce it to two. Uh, next, we take our optimized triple L and flatten the list to assembly. EVM is a stack-based processor, so flattening enables an easy translation of um, the assembly to EVM bytecode. Uh, this is easier to do using the triple L IR than it would be directly from the Python ASD. Um, and, but since triple L doesn't have uh, and, and the EVM doesn't have support for types besides the Ethereum words, the flattening becomes much easier than it would be if you were leveraging the data types in the raw microcode and trying to do it all at once. Here's an example of the EVM assembly versus the triple L representation of our sample, sample code. Um, so on, on, the, on the left, uh, you can just pass it as Final stage of compilation is turning our assembly into raw EVM bytecode. It's a fairly straightforward conversion process. You just basically do a lookup on that um, opcode's name, and then you write down what the bytecode is that uh, represents it. Um, we have a list of the different opcodes and the corresponding uh, bytecode and stack pushes and pulls that it needs to uh, use, so we can make that conversion pretty direct. The raw bytecode is then made available to upload to Ethereum, so you take this long string of uh, hexadecimal notation, and just basically upload that to Ethereum and it's good to go. Um, so what you get out of it is actually kind of in three separate sections. Uh, so you, the first part is kind of the storage spec for your contract, um, which creates, uh, creates a location of memory when you upload the contract so it knows what the state is, lo lo what the state lays out as. The second is the initialization code. It gets run and populates the initial state when you deploy the contract. And then the runtime is everything else. It's all the functionality in the contract. And that's what stays on Ethereum at the, at the specific contract's uh, code address. Um, and that's what gets executed, the init and the 
the storage uh, loading code gets uh, doesn't get stored at the address. However, since the, the code is stored in binary in Ethereum, you need to know how to interact with it. So uh, something called the ABI, most of you probably know this, but um, the, you know, the, the output of the ABI, which lets you talk to the contract, uh, knows the names and the argument types and that are going in as inputs and coming out as outputs, um, so that you can generate a raw coin All right, so that's a little review about how we lay out the Viper compiler. Uh, but where are we currently? So if you want to try Viper right now, we have an online compiler at viper.online uh, that one of the community members made. So you can give it a shot. It's not quite as useful as Remix, but um, we're looking for people who are, are interested in integrating Remix into, or integrating Viper into Remix. One problem is that since our compiler is written in Python, it's uh, you know it's a Python module. That's not something that's easily uh, put into a client-side framework. So if you guys know of any way that we can convert that to um, a JavaScript or Blossom kind of thing, uh, you know, come talk to me about it. But you can install Viper on Ubuntu using Snapcraft. We have a Snap. Uh, that's the thing that gets updated the most. Uh, we also have a Docker container that gets updated. Uh, as well as a pipeline package that is a little bit older. Um, integration with Remix would be awesome. So with Truffle, um, if, if we already have integrations and work with Embark and Populous, so listen up for those coming soon so you can use, you can try out Viper. So what's next for us? Uh, we're anticipating a feature freeze and the start of beta by the end of the month. Uh, once, once that, uh, once that process starts, we're only going to be accepting bug fixes from the things you guys find. Uh, so Viper V1 uh, will be formally verified using the K framework by the runtime verification codes. Uh, that will hopefully be complete sometime in the summer, I'm not really sure. We currently have a logo competition, so if you guys have some design chops and you want to get, get involved, uh, you can make a submission to our issue, 794. Um, that's a little design contest. Uh, it has a bounty associated with it. Uh, the two lead devs that are currently on it, me and, me and Jock, uh, put in a little bit of ETH and uh, Status put in a little bit of their status tokens. Uh, so there's a little bit of a bounty associated with that. Uh, you can also feel free to jump in and actually vote on the lows you like the most. Uh, there's one in the kind of forefront now, but who knows, if you guys all vote, it can change. Um, we're also using bounties to get uh, documentation updated for our, our compiler. The documentation is a little important. At the moment, we're trying to improve that as we move through the beta. So that's the best way we can get people involved at this point. Uh, if you want to help in any way, please come see me. Um, but this is really important because Casper and parts of sharding are using Viper in order to create the smart contracts that are running uh, the system. So we, it's really important that we get this language right um, especially as those go forward and are being used for critical parts of Ethereum's infrastructure. So lastly, I want to shout out David over here. Uh, he's going to do a little demo. And uh, Jock, which is uh, an engineer from Status that's on this whole time. Uh, he's located in South Africa. Uh, but the real MPDs in the room are all of our community members. We have 50 plus total contributors and over 1,000 comments on this project. Uh, most in the past few months, so uh, we're really looking forward to making this grow. All right.
Hey there, cool. Uh, we're gonna get started now. My name uh, is David and I uh, have done a bit of work on Viper, but given that this talk was called Viper in Action, I thought it would be super fun to get someone who's actually developing a dApp using Viper outside of uh, EF, uh, E3 Search uh, up here, and that is Hidden Adams. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Um, I wasn't actually planning on presenting today. David called me at 8 a.m. and asked me if I wanted to, so here I am. Um, <laughs> my uh, project is called Uniswap. It's an on-chain exchange automated market maker. Um, I guess a little bit similar to Bancor, but no central token and a slightly simplified mechanism. Um, I recently switched it over from, it was originally written in Solidity, but I recently switched it all over to Viper, um, which I'm enjoying a lot, I think it's great. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go over the code, and I don't know, David can jump in at any point if he wants to ask questions or direct the conversation, but yeah. Um, so the, okay, so the, the, core, the core part of my project is the factory, which is, um, so here it is here, it's, uh, it basically allows you to um, launch a single uh, exchange for any ERC-20 token, um, and so Viper recently added the ability to use uh, like, uh, interfaces for other external smart contract calls. So I'm already implementing that. Um, it pretty much has any functionality that Solidity has. I haven't had any issues uh, moving from Solidity to Viper. The only thing that I haven't been able to do is, uh, I guess, there's no fallback function yet. It's being worked on. Um, but everything else has been pretty easy to implement. Um, for example, there's events. Right, you can just do a, you do the, you just do log, uh, launch, and then you put in the parameters. And then, um, okay, so the the way this works, right, is Viper has this is something that's actually not in Solidity. That's what I believe, right? That's something called create with code of. Yeah, so it's actually I found that there's more things in Viper that aren't in Solidity, and there are things in Solidity that aren't in Viper. Uh, for example, decimals um, and custom unit types and stuff like that. Um, and this is one of them, it's create with code of uh, function, which allows you to pass in the address of an already deployed um, smart contract, and then it will launch an identical contract um, with the new address. Um, and so that's what I'm using. I have a template contract, which is basically an exchange. Um, and then this is the factory. It's a public function. Anyone can launch an exchange. So you input an, the address of the ERC-20 token. Um, it checks if that already exists. Um, if, that ex if it doesn't already exist, then it launches a new exchange using create with code of, and then uses this, uh, it basically, there's a, a setup function on that exchange contract that just got launched. And so using these external contract interfaces, you can you know, basically call this um, setup function and make sure it returns true. The reason I'm doing this is because create with code of uh, doesn't allow for constructors. Maybe that's going to be worked on in the future. I don't know. Uh, yeah, there. 
easier, easier ways to deploy uh, smart contracts, I believe, uh, are in the works. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, for now, this is the best pattern I'm using. Um, and then it basically adds a mapping between the new ERC20 token and the exchange, and then adds a mapping between the exchange and the token, and then it, you, know, you call the uh, event, and then it returns the new exchange. Oh, that's awesome. Right. Question, how are mappings declared in Viper? Okay, yeah, that's, that's, Tell this, us. that's this right up here. So um, this, you know, it's the, uh, I guess, in, okay, so you have um, the, uh, you know, you get the name, and then you do a colon, <laughs> and then you have the, uh, this is basically, you know, it's mapping the addresses to addresses. Um, in the other contract, I can show you, actually, let me go to the, uh, Go to the other contract. So that's pretty much the factory. And then this is a mapping of, uh, you know, UN 256, or you well addresses to, to uh, assigned integers. So I guess this is like the, you know, you input an address and it gives it and it puts out that integer. Thank you, Hayden. You are welcome, David. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, these are the exchange contracts, um, right? So you know. Basically, one is deployed for every ERC20 token. Um, and they have uh, these two variables that are declared, ETH pool and token pool. They are public variables. Boom. And you make it public by uh, wrapping the, the variable name in you know, parentheses and the word public. Um, I guess that creates a public function. You can call, like using Web3, just call um, ETH pool as a function and it will return the value. Great job. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, so basically um, every exchange, there's an ETH pool and a token pool for a single token. Um, and yeah, so people, basically anyone who wants can invest liquidity in an exchange. I guess most exchanges, you know, you have an order book where it matches up buyers and sellers, and then you have to, you know, find some price point where you agree on. And that sounds tricky. Yeah. So this, <laughs> so this, has, this one basically allows, you know, holds liquidity reserves. Um, each exchange holds a reserve of ETH and a single token, um, and that's stored in these, these variables. Um, and then the price rate is set automatically based on the relative availability of liquidity. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, I'm having a question regarding that declaration. So for allowance, you also wrap that in, in brackets, but there is no public. So what does that do? So, okay, so these don't have public. Uh, so you're using this one? Yeah, so this is for a mapping of a mapping. Yeah, so it's like, it, it's actually, I was going to get to this later on, but every exchange also has a built-in ERC. So each exchange allows you to trade one ERC20 token, and then it has uh, shares um, that are also an ERC20 token uh, built in. Um, and so that's, that's, this is basically like a ERC20 function. Um, and speaking of ERC20s, um, there's actually a built-in ERC20, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, so, well, this, this thing, like, how you oh it. yeah, this is basically uh, how you uh, specify uh, external contracts that you want to make calls to. Uh, so you basically uh, have an if, yeah, like an interface, and then you put it in here. ERC twenty is a special interface because it's built in Viper currently, just because it's so commonly used. So you don't even need to have an API. You can essentially put ERC twenty there and then call uh, all standard. Show how that's called in a second. So, okay, so when an exchange is first created, basically anyone who, every, everything in this, ex, everything on all these contracts is fully public. There's no single account at any point that has any ability to do anything anyone else can. There's no central fee or anything. So, um, yeah, so when it, okay, so basically, yeah, yeah let's, let's see, where's the token? Um, okay, so here's like, um, yeah, so exactly, so. We declare the, um, during when the setup function is called, it inputs a token address. You just say um, self.token address equals the input token address, and that automatically creates an ERC20 token in the exchange, uh, or an, inter in an interface for an ERC20 token um, at that address. I think we have a question. Is the assert function calling a true opcode or a reasonable It is uh, calling the bird opcode right now. Just uh, there, 
are theoretically some use cases where you'd want to throw it, eat all the gas, but it's at least uh, right now it's simpler uh, just to kind of presume that if a contract fails, the user should get the gas back. The gas back. I think I saw some discussion in the GitHub about there, there has it has been uh, yeah it's, it's in development language um, and actually I in the course of this project I've um, you know, I've submitted some bug requests or feature requests and that have already been implemented. I started working on the Viper contract like a week and a half, two weeks ago. And then I already have a new feature I requested that was implemented like yesterday. So it's an active development team and if you, you can be a part of growing this project. One might call it agile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Hayden or David, uh, whoever can answer. Um, I'm wondering, can you define a constant outside of the scope of a function? Like, can you have a constant yeah, I mean, I haven't actually done that, but I mean, you can, I believe. Uh, so right now, uh, I believe you can, but I think the language kind of, the preferred way is to kind of declare everything all at once in the constructor. And have it that way. You, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the idea with Viper is pretty much everything that you use in a contract should be declared in that contract, and it should be declared before you use it. Right, that's not like you don't call. You can't call a function that occurs later on in the um, in the code. Um, okay, so let's see. So right now you have these uh, special functions. So uh, I guess it was mentioned before that um, by default, safe math is inserted in all Viper math, um, and that was the case for everything except UIN two fifty six. Yeah, yeah, no, I know it. It was literally like this week. Yeah. Um, so, but right now, I guess it hasn't been merged yet. So for now, I have to use yeah. a special UN256. That's going away now. Yeah, those are going away. It'll look cleaner, which I'm excited for. Um, yeah. But, okay, so yeah, I guess. Okay, so you, uh, when someone initializes the, the contract, they, um, they can put, it, they put in some amount of ETH and some amount of tokens. And now you have a, an exchange rate that's automatically set based on the relative availability of liquidity. And then arbitrage will basically assure that that will always converge on the price of other exchanges. Um, and so, yeah, so, okay. So if someone wants to, for example, purchase uh, tokens with Ether, you have this function ETH the tokens. You might notice it's a private function. Um, so that's just because I have these two different types of ETH the token purchases. Um, I didn't want to have like so much extra code. Um, and you notice it's declared right in front of it. It has to be. Yes. Uh, fairly, uh, I think like uh, late last year, uh, we made the choice to make uh, visibility, uh, function visibility a requirement uh, from the get go, just because bad things, scary things can happen uh, if you don't. Yeah, and then uh, I guess all functions, I think there's only private and public. I know that Solidity has like pure, I don't know. Uh, yeah, there's constant stupid. There's, there are other decorators, but okay. yeah. none for visibility. I've been working on Viper for like two weeks, but it's been pretty easy to learn. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that you pulled out a lot of these uh, features from the language to make things much more simple. But do you find it verbose coming from Solidity? For, um, I find it, yeah. I find it completely the opposite. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, specifically right now, and that's why I was specifically mentioning these functions. Once those are, once all the UN256 length is replaced, you know, this is UN256 greater than even the cost of reserves. Um, once those are all replaced with just plus signs and minus signs, I think it will be much cleaner and, and easier to read. I think one of the main design things that has been mentioned is like readability and audibility. That it, yeah, that's goal. It's up to you guys uh, as contributors, but also as uh, potential devs using Viper to give feedback, uh, so we can keep being iterated upon. And yeah. So when you're inside a function, how does it work for storage versus memory and variables that you can load the memory? Yeah, yeah. So um, okay, so there's the storage variables I've declared at the top, right? Like each pool and token pool. Um, and then, for example, when you're exchanging ETH for tokens, 
Um, it, you can, uh, so this is to basically declaring a, a, a variable in memory, right? I basically create this invariant, which is the ETH pool multiplied by the token pool. Basically, that's held constant. That's how the exchange rate is set. Um, but then you can read the, the storage variables, right? Like self.eth pool, self.token pool. Um, the reason I'm actually declaring them here uh, as, as variables in memory too is because I use them multiple times in the function. And so it saves a little bit of gap, I figured out. S lids are expensive. Yeah, exactly. I, I, moving, so this one calls, was originally calling or loading from uh, storage twice, and it saved about 500 gas, which is uh, loading at once in, in memory. And that could be an optimization or a yeah. to automatically detect those and, and keep them in memory and just then set the variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll make it even more, less. Less verbose, more verbose. Less verbose, less verbose, more. Okay, so, so anyway, so the exchange rate is automatically set based on this invariant stuff. Um, a fee is taken out and added to the total liquidity pools. Um, and then it returns uh, some tokens to the buyer. So it just calls, you know, you have that, that ERC20 uh, interface you created. And so it just, you know, transfers back out um, and then calls the event. Um, okay, so also, you know, so that's for basic trades. You know, buyer sent it in and then the buyer gets it back out. You can also pass in an address and then that'll go to some recipient, kind of like shapeshift. So you can like send it ETH and then the other person will receive when we say go. Um, do the totally random token. Um, and then token to ETH is the same thing in reverse. It takes in tokens and it outputs ETH. It uses the same price determination, same price mechanism. Um, so I'm not gonna go over that too much. Um, oh, here's some stuff with like time. So, okay, so um, when you're comparing uh, different like variable types, you have to explicitly convert part of like the audibility, readability stuff. Like everything should be really clear. Um, so, you know, I, I'm in, like, so I have this timeout parameter that's coming in. You have to, the timestamp is by default, I believe, uh, some specific time variable, time delta. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's a special type. You can't like it doesn't like implicitly. Yes. Question and load up your front end. And we're oh, yeah. short on time. Okay, we're we need to show time. that to people. Okay. Yeah. In, in two seconds. Oh wait. Um, what? Why do you use uh, you use two parts to do you kind of still need to deal with the EVM? Okay. So specifically, the reason I'm using U in two fifty six is the invariant ends up being a huge number, like like you know more than like e to the forty power. So that you know it's the limit of it, both above the limit of 128. Um, so yeah, let me load up the front end. Where is it? Okay, and then I'm gonna quickly mention, so I mentioned how every exchange is for a single token, um, but what I implemented is token to token exchanges, which allows you to, you know, convert token to ETH for one token exchange. Uh, uh, you know, you could convert like a piece of go to ETH on one exchange, and send that ETH to like the Gollum token exchange and go ETH to Gollum. So you go like Omisa go to Gollum in one, in one uh, function call. Um, yeah, kind of like Bancor. Do it. Question. So, what, uh, what has, what's been your greatest challenge so far using Viper? Um, definitely, uh, oh, I'm gonna ask. Did you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but my greatest challenge has been um, just there's not much documentation or example projects. I found with Solidity that there's a lot of examples I can work from and pull from. There's a lot of documentation. And I know that's being worked on too. Um, but yeah, they're just more, as more people use it, I think it will become a lot easier to use because you'll have more examples to pull from. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so this is, uh, this is basically if you wanted to like exchange like um, these are all testnet tokens. Just running on a testnet. Um, so this account has you know 10, 10 ETH and zero ETH. Go, you can see at the top. Put in one ETH. So the, as you see, the rate is variable, right? Depending on how many you're buying, you're getting a different rate. because It's liquidity sensitive. Um, rather than you know, but the, the advantage is you don't have to wait for a seller. Um, and 
I think one really uh, important thing uh, to think about is, uh, have you, the gas costs, have you done a gas cost comparison? Um, if I'm being totally honest, because I, like comparisons to what? Comparison, like, to between Solidity and Viper? Oh, no, I was talking about, uh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, for an ETH to token purchase, it's like an eighth, an eighth to a tenth of Bancor, and then for token to token, it's about a fifth. Gas cost. Then that. What about <laughs> Solidity uh, and Viper? Well, Solidity and Viper. I haven't done that at all. Okay. Cool. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that don't work. Uh, oh, okay. So you see that the the purchase went through, right? The ETH went down by one. We say go went up by fifty. About there was a fee that was taken off. That's why it was slightly less. Awesome. Yeah. Super easy to use. This was uh, totally using this laptop was totally uh, unplanned, and we were able to get it working and make trades. Like that, so and actually, yeah, you could do like any token to any token, but then he has to call the approved. But I thought it'd be easier to. Uh, but cool. Yeah. Any any more questions or are we good? We, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Whenever you become a new maker, can you um, start introducing? You have scratch the communication viper. If you raise the level of scratch, <laughs> make sure you tell me that the bytecode that you generate likely to be uh, more complex, and therefore. I think uh, initially, yes, but that's more because it's a work in progress and you can't really solve everything at once. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of long term, I think do you like, like work on the compiler and optimization. Uh, if, it, if it basically the bytecode doesn't have to be more complex, uh, but it's harder to get it uh, there. And given that Viper, uh, they're still like, uh, kind of, right now there are bigger fish to fry, but that will be a focus eventually so that the competitive smart contract program is like rich. Yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to have a comment. Um, I did look at the Viper in terms of the bytecode it generates mm -hmm. compared to Solidity for one specific case, which is the arrays. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do arrays in Solidity and Viper, actually Viper generates more efficient code because it del uh, the, the solidity, when it lays down the, um, the array, it uses the, the index in the array and then it concatenates it with the base uh, address and then hashes it. But so basically your elements of the array are dispersed around the storage of the contract. In the Viper, however, they all serve together in one group, which actually makes accessing them uh, less gas uh, costly. And also it increases the efficiency when you run it on the EVM. So it's one, one instance where it's already more efficient. That's awesome, thank you. I didn't realize that. Yeah, one of the reasons I moved to Viper is I noticed that, um, like for example, Carl and uh, Phil was here, I don't know if he's still here, but um, they both mentioned it, like that they, oh, they prefer it. And like the Casper contract is written in Viper, the, the uh, sharding collation contract, is, or validator manager contract is being written in Viper. So that's what kind of made me think, okay, maybe Viper actually is, and like Vitalik created Viper, yeah. so I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally bet against it. <laughs> cool. Are you saying WebAssembly like in general or from like a Viper, from a Viper specific? I would say yes, but that is uh, down the road. And like the focus right now is really getting it so people can safely use Viper on mainnet uh, just with the EVM. And then Blossom stuff is super cool, super, super sexy, uh, but yeah. We want to get it working like baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah, that's well, pretty cool. much it. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, you'll give it a try. Oh, and thank you, Hayden. Oh, and also, if you want to check out an example of Viper code, you can just github.com slash uniswap. I have the same contract in Solidity and Viper. You can see how to move between the two.
we have the three speakers that will talk about uh, form over application. It's a pretty important uh, topic in the space now. Uh, there will be Quentin from uh, uh, Chain Security, Stephen from Quantstam, and Ari from uh, Inria, and working on different projects. Uh, so, Quentin. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, so yeah, I'm Koto from, uh, from Chain Security. I'm a blockchain security engineer there. And um, so today we'll talk about Securify, which is uh, kind of the, the, the short name for declarative static analysis of smart contract. And Securify was um, developed at the, the ICE Center at ETH Zurich, so in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, so first, quickly to motivate uh, Securify, I'm sure that all of you in this room have heard of the um, security flaws of uh, the, Ethereum, the Ethereum ecosystem lately. So keywords are DAO, reentrancy bug, um, um, multi-seek wallet, and so on. But I, I assume that most of you in this room are aware of this. So there is a need for security, basically. Um, but when we talk about these bugs at, uh, at some, some high level, it's usually solidity, solidity bugs. So programmers write uh, smart contracts in this uh, high level language, which then compiles down to the EVIM code, which is actually run on the Ethereum blockchain. And of course, you can use other high-level languages. So for, for the, those of you who were here uh, at the previous talks, uh, so Viper was, uh, was mentioned, so which makes uh, some, some different um, trade-offs uh, from, from Solidity. So what is good to remember about this EVM code, which is actually run on, uh, on the blockchain, is that it, it's uh, stack-based, it is untyped, it has no function. So when you write the function in Solidity, it actually compiles down to uh, to some jumps in the code. And it was not designed with formal analysis in mind. So if you want to, to see what, what the language with, uh, with more secure priorities, um, like how, how it, it could be designed, you can look at Viper in their uh, GitHub page, which is actually quite interesting in, in, uh, in terms of trade-off that they make to make sure that uh, developers write safe, secure, um, safe uh, smart contracts. Um, so this, but what is this EVM code which runs on the blockchain? It consists of uh, several opcodes, so some, some are really basic. For instance, when you do an addition, you have a corresponding opcode on the blockchain, which is gonna do just that. And so for more uh, sophisticated ones, uh, we can mention uh, mStore, mLoad, sStore, and sLoad, which uh, act on the memory and the storage of the, of the smart contract, and which make sure that you can actually um, keep some state, be it within, uh, within a transaction or um, among transactions. So, like the difference between memory and storage. Um, so, what what do these opcodes do? Like, what do they act upon? They so yeah. First, the the like all these opcodes can be found in the yellow paper. Um, but so these opcodes they actually act on on the, some system state, which is obviously what the yellow paper uh, says. So, an opcode acts on the storage, which is uh, like the, the persistent um, uh, state of the of the contract. It acts on the memory, which is non-persistent and reinitialized every time. Um, it acts on, on the stack, which has some limited size. And it, it, also, it also uses the block information, so like the number of the block, the timestamp. So once we have uh, defined this state, we can uh, actually define a contract semantics. So when, when you have, um, when you have a, a state sigma, uh, so defined by the storage, the memory, um, the stack and the block information. When you have um, a transaction, so um, defined by, uh, by who uh, is, is emitting this transaction and which opcodes it is made of and, and some other information. Uh, you can also define a trace, so which is defined by the, um, by the uh, action of the opcodes on this state. So every time you're gonna, um, you're gonna use, you're gonna run an opcode on the state, you're gonna obtain a new state and so on until you run out of opcode. So this is basically what a transaction, transaction does. So you start from sigma zero, then you go to, to sigma one, which is just the action of the, of the first opcode, and on and on and on and on, until you reach the, the final opcode, and you reach, uh, in the end, the final state, which, if the transaction was not reverted, um, induces a change in a, in a blockchain state. So if you want to define the semantics of, of a smart contract, if you want to, to, to define uh, what what your smart contract does, you can you can say that it is a set of all traces uh, for for this contract, the, the set of all uh, these information that can be that can be used with this contract. 
So why, why, why did I do all this formalism? Why did I mention all these uh, sigma and opcodes and, and, and whatnot? Like, which looks kind of complicated, uh, which, but which is not so much like the compare differences with the um, Ethereum yellow paper, which really like go deep into the details, which you need to do when you, when you run this uh, Ethereum blockchain. So, but this formalism um, was, was helpful for me to, to define interesting properties uh, for, your, for your smart contract. So one of these properties is that of unrestricted rights, where you can, um, so the intention, the intention with the, this pattern is that anybody can, can execute some line of code. So for instance, here I have uh, the, this, this line of code, which is owner is equal, um, like we assign the value of message sender to the owner of, of some contract. So you can imagine, for instance, the, like a, um, a wallet, or uh, yeah, like the, 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 the best example is really a wallet. So if somebody can do that, then it's bad, because of course your wallet, uh, the owner of the wallet can be changed. And so, and since the owner can do anything with the wallet, then you, you of course have a security problem. So we want to be able to kind of formalize, formalize this, uh, this property. So with the previous formalism, I can say that um, a right to an offset O is unrestricted if for any user address A, there is a transaction which is called by this A, and there is a trace, so starting from, from the initial state and on and on and on, uh, such that there is a one, um, one opcode which is actually a nestor and which is gonna modify this, uh, this offset with some value here. So uh, here you, you can see that already I can, I can uh, uh, formalize this property and, uh, and say, uh, like formalize my intuition about this unrestricted uh, right. Another property is uh, that of block ether. So um, the, the reasoning be behind this property is that we don't want to have contracts which can receive ether but cannot uh, transfer ether because it would mean that you have uh, locked ether on the, on the blockchain which, is, uh, which doesn't benefit anyone. Uh, so the intuition here is that you have at least a one payable function so to which you can send ether but there is no transfer from the contract so you cannot uh, extract ether from the contract. And so the, the, the formal um, version of this, that there is a transaction which increases the balance. So you, have, you start with some balance here of the contract and you end up with a new balance which is greater than the, than the initial balance. <coughs> and um, on top of that, there, there are no transaction extracting ether. That is, for all transaction, um, if, if there is uh, an opcode uh, on this uh, in this transaction which is uh, a call, uh, then the amount uh, for any value here, then the amount which is transferred in, in this transaction is actually zero. Um, so maybe here you can see some, some, some things that might be a, a bit, bit uh, wrong with this slide. Maybe you, you see what? So uh, well, one thing is that you actually can always send ether to a contract via the, the self-destruct uh, operation. So, and you cannot, even if you don't have any payable function, you cannot uh, reject this ether. And so, and the second thing is that, of course, there are other opcodes which um, which uh, which can transfer ether. So, of course, this is not the whole picture here. Um, so, there are of course more security properties that we can uh, we can define using this uh, formalism. So, I'm, uh, I mentioned the, the first two. Uh, you can uh, yeah, you can mention some others. I will just uh, mention briefly the, the reentrancy bug. So, yeah, that you can define using the same. Um, so there are automated techniques to kind of try to, to find these, uh, these flaws and these properties. Uh, so first is uh, testing. So for instance, when you, when you use Truffle, you write tests for your contracts and make sure that they, don't, uh, that, that they respect some properties with some, some inputs. Uh, you can use dynamic analysis. So the most uh, famous example in, in our space is um, Oyente, which uh, uses dynamic analysis to kind of to, to try to find um, a flaws in your contract. And the, the topic of, of this talk today is uh, rather automated verification, so Securify. Um, here I should mention that the, the, the one keyword is really automated. Uh, I assume some of you uh, attended the, the, the talk about, uh, about, about KEDM, um, so where they actually try to specify the whole semantics of the contract and uh, really verify it in a more uh, traditional meaning of the, of the, of the term. Yeah. Um, Form of verification. Here we try to, to really find some uh, general patterns uh, 
that we can match against the contract. So you, you can see reentrancy, for instance. This is something that we can check in null contracts, whereas there are some other um, more precise uh, specification that are kind of um, more, more uh, demanding in terms of how much time you're going to spend writing these specifications and how much time you're going to spend uh, proving them. Uh, while here, really, what we do is some automated verification of these uh, patterns. So these are different trade-offs. There is not uh, really one solution that is better than the other. They're all complementary in, in some way or the other. So it, it's good to keep your, your mind open when you when you have some some uh, smart contract project and to see what um, like what solutions you have and what what fits the best and maybe you can even combine them to have like the best security. Uh, but so here today I, I will talk about uh, Securify. So. Uh, to remember as well is that properties like unrestricted rights need to be checked on all traces and this is why you have this uh, this kind of a blue area which really tries to, to, to cover uh, everything so i will talk about the, the, the details of security so sorry it's going to be quite technical but i'm i'm uh, i'm uh, willing to to, uh, to kind of redo the, the slides after if some 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 people are interested but don't get everything but i hope you will and um, so First, the, um, um, so you, you, we Securify um, uses the AVM binary to do all these kind of checks. And so first, we're gonna try to, to get this intermediate representation, which uh, kind of says what the what the contract does. And so from from this really basic uh, basic intermediate representation, we're gonna use static analysis to have some uh, some semantic representation about this contract. So it's good to remember that at the binary level, you don't have any comments, you don't have any, any viable names. So this is just code, right? And the, the, the meaning you give it is really a human thing, right? So we, we kind of try to deconstruct uh, the, the compilation process by obtaining this, uh, this semantic representation. For instance, uh, saying that the, the offset uh, OX2O is, uh, is a balance, that another offset is a constant, uh, and that, uh, yeah, and so all this kind of, of basic uh, facts. And from this semantic representation of, uh, of our EVM binary, we're gonna try to, um, to match some patterns and get the security report that you, you get at the end. So uh, the, these patterns, um, they, they can be distinguished uh, in, two, in, two, in two categories. So first, uh, when, when we talk about property, there, there are some secure behaviors with respect to a property. That is, for instance, uh, these contracts don't have a reentrancy bug, and these contracts have a reentrancy bug. So of course, you want your smart contract to be in this area. And but what we do when we when we do automated verification here is that we define some compliance patterns. So for instance, for entrancy, uh, we're gonna say you don't do any you, you don't do any call to any external contract. This is of course uh, a really an approximation because just because you, you do any uh, just because you do an external call to to another contract doesn't mean that you have a reentrancy. But if you really want to approximate it uh, really really um, grossly really. Sorry, really roughly, uh, it's gonna be, you, you can do that, and then you can have like a, a sub, subset of, uh, of the previous set. Uh, violation pattern, uh, same, you, you're gonna try to, to uh, under approximate the insecure behavior. And so, why do we do this approximation? Is that because we want to be able to actually check our properties. Checking the, the full area is too difficult, but so checking these compliance patterns and violation patterns is, uh, is hopefully easier. So first, the, the first step of the compilation. Um, so you start from, from the binary, and then we, you try to, um, to, to reconstruct the control flow graph, uh, so from the jumps, and trying to, to, um, to really have these basic blocks where the, the instructions follow one another. And so it's, it, for those familiar with compiler, it's really some, some kind of a reverse process. And you also have this, uh, this uh, static single assignment form, which is also easier for static analysis. So this is really classic, uh, cl classic stuff for uh, for uh, anything which is related to, to uh, static analysis. And then, yeah, some optimization, of course, to, to have something which runs in a, in a decent amount of time. The second step, uh, so static analysis, from which you actually um, write down the list of facts about your code that you could infer uh, based uh, on this uh, on this intermediate representation. Um, so an example of, of semantic facts. Um, so first, may follow uh, when you have the, 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 the program counter. Um, so the second program counter follows the previous program counter. So 
and, and uh, so another one that it must follow. Um, then you have also data dependencies where you, you, you describe what your data and your contract depends on. And so you see here, like just, just a little of uh, facts, and of course you can, you can do much more, and uh, the goal is in the end to, to combine them to, uh, to match against the, the patterns that, they, that I described earlier. Um, so first one, uh, just a simple example of, of, of how you, you, you define um, uh, a semantic fact. So the may follow um, predicate is uh, defined by using the, the follow predicate, which, which just says that there is an instruction after another. And then you have this kind of transitive closure uh, from which you, you can say that, uh, that, that an, an instruction which is far in the code uh, may follow another one. So I have like this small example here. Um, so here you have the, the instruction at the program counter two follows the one. So this is obvious because this is uh, right after. Um, you have the, the third follows the, the second, and the three follows the, the four follows the third. And from this already you can infer this may follow um, that that four may follow the, the first instruction. So you have this kind of, of dependency, and you can see that uh, already you you have a more uh, global. Uh, overview of, of your contract. Uh, you can infer um, uh, a lot more uh, input facts. So I've talked about the, the follows um, predicate. Uh, you can you can say that x is a balance, for instance, which can be relevant, for instance, when when you when you transfer either. Um, you can say that an offset is constant, and you can say that there is a, an, an M store and load and so on, or that you have a dependencies between variables. So here you say that uh, Z depends on, on X and Z depends on Y, for instance. So this, this is really just an example, of course, like uh, in practice, in the implementation, you have a lot more facts to actually deduce interesting patterns. Um, another inference rule that, that I will uh, briefly talk about, not too much, because it's really, really goes into detail, but so that of, of uh, data dependency. So it may depend on, uh, we said that the, um, that the variable x depends on the tag t. Uh, for instance, if, if uh, you assign uh, t to the, to the variable x. Another rule is that if you have, um, if you have uh, that the not code combines x and x prime, and that x prime may depend on t, then you have this kind of uh, transitivity to, to obtain the, the second rule, and so on. And so you, can, you have like, more rules to, uh, to actually have some sound predicate. Um, yeah, and then like the, the, the question of whether the program counter impacts on the, on the fact or not really depends on the precise fact. So in the end, uh, here uh, for, for this data dependency, you can see here that the, that the x depends on, on the balance. And since you have an M star here, that the x is stored in this offset, and then uh, you load this offset into y, you already have that uh, y uh, may depend on the balance. So you can see here that you, you really constructed this, uh, um, these facts step by step. The <coughs> final step is uh, once you have this semantic representation, you want to match it against a uh, relevant pattern. So for instance, whether there is a reentrancy. You, you, <laughs> because now you, you know some, something about your, your program, uh, but you, you also know what, what you don't want in your program. Um, so, uh, you're gonna, yeah, so you're gonna infer more facts about, about your program. Uh, the example of, that I have here is that of the compliance pattern uh, of uh, restricted write. So we have that, uh, that you don't have, that all writes are restricted if uh, for all S store operation at any program counter PC that the offset O for any value, uh, it is, the, the offset is determined by the color. So you can think of the balance in, a, in some uh, bank contract, um, <laughs> if you have the balance mapping, and you, you like any color is able to write to the message sender key of this mapping, then of course this is this is fine because um, the offset is determined by the color. Whereas if 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 anybody can uh, can write to um, to to the offset to the offset of the owner, then you of course have a have a problem. A violation pattern, so where you actually uh, yeah, violate uh, uh, property would be that there is some S -S store um, to, to an offset O in which uh, the offset does not depend on the color and in which uh, the, the program counter does not depend on the color. So for instance, uh, 
uh, it is fine in some examples that um, that the owner can do can do anything in the contract, and that's why you have this uh, second condition where if you have a, a check that does, uh, for instance, is Mr. Sender equal to, to owner, um, then then it's okay because you you do have this check and this uh, awareness of what you, you're doing. Um, yeah, and so like this, you can generalize this for for all the patterns, and uh, the, the the problem then is that. I mentioned compliance patterns and violation patterns, but you have to rate them to, to, uh, to overall security properties, but the domains are, are greater. So you, you need to make sure that you actually uh, compile subsets of these properties. But usually it's not a problem, for instance, for, for this case you can understand why in, in, in both cases you either respect or violate the, the property. So this is in short uh, what Securify does. So getting from, going from the binary, which is what runs on the, on the blockchain, getting this intermediate representation, which is some kind of uh, decompilation, getting some semantic representation where you actually try to, to go back to what the programmer has, where there is actually meaning uh, in, in, in everything, where there, is, uh, there are meaningful viable names, and then trying to infer um, whether some patterns are matched in, the, in, this, uh, in this program. And so there are, so that, it's an, uh, one example of what is developed at the ICE Center at TTH. Uh, some other example you can see on, on these slides if you're interested. And um, so, yeah, uh, our, so I work at Change Security where we have uh, like this close relation with, with ETH and, and, uh, and Securify. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if you're interested, just, just uh, get in touch. We do formal, we do um, audits for smart contracts and we do also like uh, some, some consulting on, on the side. Um, so yeah, just, just feel free to, to, to get in touch and I thank you for your attention. Hello? Hello? Thank you very much. Um, really pleased to be here. I'm Stephen Stewart, and I'll be talking about computer-aided reasoning for smart contracts. I'm with QuantStamp, um, and I think um, what I want to say here is I came here with the assumption that there will be a lot of developers in the audience. I'm a developer too, and so I wanted to um, present something that would be introductory. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about symbolic execution and model checking. More abstractly, as the title says, computer-aided reasoning for smart contracts. I think it's sort of a self-descriptive title, using a computer to help you reason about your code. And our motivation, of course, for this, very similar to uh, we saw in the previous uh, talk, most of you are probably aware of the DAO project um, and, and the $50 million worth that was, uh, for lack of a better term, hacked. Um, and, you know, more recently we saw a different kind of vulnerability, this batch overflow exploit, um, where although there were, to my knowledge, no significant losses of digital assets, there certainly uh, impacts um, on the uh, feelings of certainty or confidence that people have in the platform. Of course, um, if you're not familiar with this, it was a, a vulnerability that allowed you to mint tokens um, <laughs> as much as you wanted, as far as I know. So obviously not a desirable uh, property to have for your smart contract. Um, so I kind of want to speak in terms of uh, what you could think of as three different levels at which you would want to do reasoning. Um, so if you're a Solidity developer, of course, and I'm going to say that all developers should be aware of all three of these levels. Um, so if you're a Solidity developer, of course, you're writing Solidity code and you want to reason about the behavior of your program in terms of the code you actually write. But there's also the code you don't necessarily see. So thinking in terms of the EVM, there are other kinds of vulnerabilities that can be introduced at that level. And then you should also have uh, familiarity with how the blockchain um, 
the way I sometimes say it is how the blockchain executes your code. It's kind of a simplification. But basically, you want to be aware of how uh, transactions that implement state changes in your smart contract are ordered and different other considerations. So if you want to develop smart contracts, you need, you can, I would argue that you do need to be aware of these kinds of vulnerabilities. I'm not going to dive into any of these in great depth. Of course, we're going to talk about re-engines or not. But I do recommend taking a look at some of the literature out there. It's very accessible. It's not overly academic. This, uh, this paper here is a survey of attacks on Ethereum smart contracts. It's really uh, something I highly recommend to take a look at. So computer-aided reasoning kind of sounds like magic. You have some code, put it into this machine reasoning engine, and out pops a result. Kind of amazing if you think about it. Um, well, it's not that simple, of course. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there are, uh, this has been explored in, in, for a number of years in both academia and industry. Um, that, you know, uh, there's been a significant research effort into building these technologies and advancing these technologies and transitioning them from the world of theory into something practical. Um, and so the, the objective, though, the, the, the ultimate goal is to have automatic, efficient, and exhaustive checks. Um, but when, when you sort of drill down what that actually means, um, it, it kind of varies from your perspective. What does it mean to be exhaustive? Uh, well, if you're, if you're doing something like model checking, well, how, how comprehensive or how fully representative is your model? Um, so you might exhaustively check something that itself is not necessarily exhaustive. Um, and just to kind of emphasize, you know, uh, companies like Microsoft, who uh, at Microsoft Research, uh, they've developed Z3, uh, which is an SMT solver. It's a very important tool. So companies like Microsoft are very interested um, in um, computer-aided reasoning tools. Um, I believe there's a tool called SLAM that's used to check C code automatically. It's known to have helped find um, bugs in the Windows kernel. And then you can think of also uh, safety critical systems. So if you're thinking about NASA and rockets, um, there's, there's a situation where you want to make sure you get it right. So NASA is quite known for using formal methods um, in, for safety critical software. Um, they've developed something called Java Pathfinder, which is a model checker. Uh, uh, sort of a marriage with symbolic execution. And this has been applied to a number of in-house uh, projects um, for NASA. Facebook is also known to use static analysis. Um, so, you know, these, these are illustrative of, of success stories um, in industry. And I think you can understand that smart contracts, um, although arguably not necessarily uh, safety critical, um, you know, smart contracts that hold a lot of value are certainly uh, significant targets for individuals looking to exploit opportunities. Um, so we're going to look at, have kind of a running example here. Um, there's two functions, one on the left and one on the right. Withdraw. So you've got some money in the bank and you want to withdraw it. Pretty straightforward. It checks to see, well, do I have anything in, in my account? Um, and if I do, I um, send it to some destination address, which in this case is me, the one withdrawing the funds, and it updates the balance, the bank balance, and it updates my account. So it's a simple ledger, basically. Pretty straightforward. On the right, transfer balance. So what if I want to send all my money to you? Well, this function will attempt to do that. Now, there's actually a little problem with this code, and we're going to see this later. Um, maybe think about if you can detect what the problem is. A moment. I didn't quite get it right away, to be honest. Um, but there's a problem in that code, and we'll, we'll get back to that. So, symbolic execution. Um, I'm going to attempt um, to give you my intuition um, on what symbolic execution means. Um, you know, I, I think of it, um, first of all, I think of the idea of, if you think from a testing point of view, okay, symbolic execution is kind of a generalization of testing. Okay? What if you could reason about your program and the exploration of the execution paths of your program in a symbolic way, so that you can reason in terms of symbols, 
in order to have a more exhaustive, comprehensive exploration of doing that. So it's a very intuitive thing to do as a human. You, you, when you review your own code, I'm sure you're often kind of doing this process without even necessarily realizing it. When you're doing a code review and you're thinking about all the possible pitfalls uh, that could happen. So the notion of computer-aided reasoning, of course, you would like to leverage a computer that's more precise and less likely to make a mistake to help you do that. So static, uh, sorry, symbolic execution um, is a kind of uh, analysis of programs on unspecified inputs. So I'm not writing unit tests. Um, I'm basically saying, OK, go ahead, execute my code, explore all the possible paths. And then along the way, there might be certain um, patterns, certain types of vulnerabilities I'm looking for. If you detect those, hey, please let me know. And that's, that's kind of what um, a, symbolic, a symbolic executor will do. And there's this notion of a symbolic state. So if you're, if you're familiar with the concept of state, of course, if you're thinking of, you know, um, uh, you have your program counter, you have your variables, and what is, you have the contents of memory. A symbolic state represents, um, uh, symbolically represents variables as values or expressions. And you can imagine as the program executes, you can build up an expression. So for example, um, if I have x equals 0 and I say x equals uh, x plus 1, well, I can say, well, x is equal to 1. But if I'm thinking symbolically, I might want to keep track of the value of x by saying, well, x equals x plus 1. And maybe later, I subtract y. So x equals x plus 1 minus y. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Now, some of the, sim the symbols here, so you have your code. We, we, this is to represent the, the paths in your code. The circle with the, the red circle with the line through it indicates a path that's not reachable. So as you build up, uh, as you build up the expressions, or better called path conditions, you can feed these to a solver to see if a state is actually reachable. The green P tells us that, that indeed that is a reachable state. And the triangle says there's something you should look at here. It's a warning. So if we look at the transfer balance uh, function here, um, you know, line 11 corresponds, it's called alpha. It corresponds with that square at the top that says alpha. Um, and basically, it's a condition. It says, um, if uh, the center's balance is greater than zero, do something. Otherwise, don't. Well, if it's false, meaning the condition's not true, then you just go to the state. You see it's indicated with a green P. There's no, there's no, we haven't detected any problems with this code. Remember, I told you there is a problem with this code. And you can see it for all the other conditions, beta and gamma, um, if those conditions are true, um, we go to the right, we're fine. But there's, there's not, I don't detect anything here. So um, symbolic execution has not detected the bug in this code. There's no reentrancy, no division by zero. Um, nothing, to, nothing to see here, it seems. And just, just to sort of step away from our example slightly, um, thinking, of, thinking about reachability and path conditions, which I mentioned earlier, um, what I want you to observe here are these expressions on the left side are being mapped to variables. So read this, this, this dark block here with, with variables listed. Read that top to bottom as a, Boolean, uh, as a Boolean formula. So if I say y is less than 5, I might call that x1. Um, and I have an expression here with a, a conjunction. And I might say, well, let's call the left side x2 and the right side x3. And then the bottom here, I'm using y again. I'm saying y is greater than or equal to 5. Well, that's just not x1. So I start to build up uh, this symbolic representation. And there's a tool called the SAT solver that's able to take these expressions, um, these formulas, and try to find satisfying assignments. So basically, does there ex exist an assignment of true or false to these variables? Uh, such that the entire expression is true. If there is, we have a satisfying, satisfying assignment. It tells us that we have a reachable state. And if it doesn't, then we don't have a reachable state. And there are also um, there's something called an SMT solver, 
or a theory solver, uh, which you might utilize because there may be certain types of expressions or data structures that you want to reason about where there are what are called theories that effectively model the behavior of, let's say, an array, for example, adding elements to or uh, modifying the contents of a position in an array, the kinds of operations you can perform on an array. So it may be useful to work within a specialized theory to reason about path conditions. All right, so let's look at symbolic execution again where we do find a problem. This is our withdraw function, and we, we do have a re-entrancy issue here. Um, once again, um, we start at line two, which corresponds with that top box up there. We're calling it delta. Um, if it's false, okay, no problem. We're not even gonna enter this block of code. If it's true, okay. Um, now we're at the epsilon line, line three. Bank balance greater than zero. Okay, uh, if, if, if that condition is false, no problem. Um, if it's true, we go to four, line four. Now, we, we know we've, we've specialized our code to look for this pattern. As we're exploring these paths, we realize that we're going to call another contract here. And this could introduce an issue. So what could happen is we may have a path that brings us back to that same line of code. We could re-enter it. Uh, we might be clever enough, though, to, to actually take a look at this condition here involving the balances and detect whether or not the, um, the values, the state there, is unmodified such that it's possible that that condition will be true again and it will reach that line of code again. So since if we don't know what contract is being called, it's really hard to say if they're actually, so this is one of the pitfalls of this approach. Really, I can say I think there's a re possible re-entrancy exploit. I can't tell you absolutely. I don't know what contract you're calling. Um, I don't know um, if, uh, if that contract that you're calling is actually calling back to the first contract. It kind of looks like this. We have contract A, contract B. First, you deposit, um, let's say, some ether. Then you want to withdraw it. And um, you, see, you, you send it to contract B, it hits the fallback function, which then calls back to contract A to do the withdraw for A for B. Um, so this is, this is probably the most famous um, exploit uh, relating to the DAO project. But I think the, the point I really want to make here is if you're a Solidity developer and you wrote those three lines of code up there, you're probably thinking you're okay. It looks good, it does what it's supposed to do. So there's, there's a nuance here, this kind of uh, recursion that happens here that's not obvious. So you really need to think in a nuanced way. Um, you know, going back to the three levels I mentioned earlier, thinking of uh, vulnerabilities introduced to Solidity, thinking about the EVM, thinking about the blockchain. And there's this, this kind of marriage of technologies with symbolic execution and uh, another technique called model checking. Now with model checking, you see we have code and specification. So basically, you can model your program in some formalized way, and similarly, in a formal way, specify the expected behaviors of that program, then you can use computer-aided reasoning tools um, to test for certain properties, whether they hold or not. Um, and so, this brings to mind, can we actually detect that bug that I, I, I alluded to earlier? Suppose we have an invariant. So an invariant, an invariant is an expression that should always hold true in every state of your program. So here the invariant is bank balance is the sum of all balances. Um, a mumble checker, let me see, what's my next slide? Okay, so if you, if you when you reach the, um, state at which you're calling transfer balance. Let's look on the right side. Suppose I want to transfer my balance to my co-founder, Richard. Um, I don't think I want to do that, but if I did, everything looks fine. Okay, so his balance increases by the amount that I sent, and I'm transferring my full balance, so my balance gets set to zero. And now, uh, now I have no money. 
Um, but what if I thought, for some reason, I want to send my balance to myself? And so this is the edge case that the programmer here didn't think about. If I send it to myself, well, at line 13, this is, maybe this was my idea. I just doubled my balance. Great. But at line 14, I lost everything. So I actually wiped out, I wiped out my, my balance. And this means that the invariant will no longer hold. Um, so the sum of all the balances is now missing the ether that I just, I just tossed away. Or maybe it's a token, some kind of digital asset. Now, model checking is not without its challenges. Um, there's something very well known as the state space explosion problem, uh, which can re really reduce the ability to detect properties in each state, um, increases the complexity of trying to determine reachability. Um, there's um, this notion of state size, and basically, as the complexity, what I would say here is as the complexity increases, um, it's harder to use these tools for reasoning. It just takes longer. So what you can do is you can abstract away um, some of the complexity and reason about your program in terms of those abstractions. This is something um, that, that can help you out. Computing reachability. So, so both symbolic execution and model checking are often combined together. So you're exploring the execution paths, but you're also checking, can, uh, checking whether or not certain property invariants hold or not. So these, these technologies, most, uh, or many tools, will actually uh, combine the use of these techniques. Uh, by comparison, um, we can say that they're both exhaustive. Um, with a, with a star up there, basically you can imagine as the state, if the state space really explodes out of hand, it could take uh, an extremely long time to perform this exhaustive search. Um, and then also there are just physical bounds. You know, um, there are bounds on the number of bits that you can use to represent integers, bounds on the amount of memory. Um, and in practice, you might actually want to do something called bounded model checking, where you put certain constraints on, for example, um, Think about loops. Like um, I might be worried that I'm going to perform this search and I enter an infinite loop. Or <laughs> uh, so basically, you could put a bound on. Say, hey, I'll unroll loops to some fixed amount. Um, concurrency. Um, so what, what we're saying uh, in terms of concurrency is symbolic execution is essentially a sequential exploration, um, and you don't quite have the ability to. If you think of a multi-threaded program, to, to exhaustively uh, test that, you would want to check all interleavings of operations of all of the threads. Um, so this is something you could do with model checking. Plug and play. So symbolic execution, yeah, plug your code in, see what happens. Model checking, you need a specification. Um, and creating a specification requires, um, can require significant expertise. For one thing that programmers can do is, uh, you know, annotate their code with assertions and require statements to, in some sense, uh, imply what your intentions are and kind of give a sense of uh, specification. So I'm going to wrap up here. I know I'm out of time. So um, Quantstamp, our goal is to provide uh, automated checks. You can go to our website. We'll uh, provide you with a report. Kind of looks like that, and. I think I'll just sum up by saying a lot of the tools out there are actually really hard to use. Um, you know, some of them are come from are very academic. They might even be hard to get them to build and compile. Uh, we're trying to make it really easy. We want developers um, to write better smart contracts, and we're trying to provide tools that really simplify that process. And that's it. So thank you.
formally verified crypto? Raise your hand. So what is formally verified crypto? Formally verified crypto. Formally verified crypto. You know, crypto that's been through a model check has its properties well defined, has a functional specification, which says what the math is supposed to do, and we can prove that the code does that math. Okay, so how many people here are running Mozilla Firefox? Okay. So, Mozilla Firefox actually runs formally verified crypto. No one saw it coming here late at night, version 57, but indeed it did appear. And Google Chrome caught up not so long after. So, the great thing about formally verified crypto is even though it appears to be very obtuse and academic, model checking, and a bunch of weird math, uh, it has actually been deployed to solve a lot of the uh, broken problems in protocol design, in cryptographic design in the web. And so, in this talk, it's going to be kind of like a blast from the past. We're going to describe how incredibly broken, everyone's like, oh my god, the EVM is so broken. Solidity, ah, oh. but the web was broken for about 20 years before people even noticed, and JavaScript uh, as well. So, um, so, so I don't think Ethereum developers should feel so bad. In fact, uh, as an old school web guy, I feel this is probably a really uh, amazing moment because uh, this is the moment where uh, you guys can start out on the right foot and do a bunch of cool stuff and learn all the mistakes that uh, you made. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, I'm Harry Halpin. I used to work at the World Wide Web Consortium. I left, quit. Uh, now I work at uh, MIT and INRIA. And most of this work, the heavy lifting, is from Karthi Paragavan at INRIA, or TLS. I did the web crypto here and stuff. So, uh, so basically, everyone knows what this is, I assume, right? Diffie-Hellman, right? OK, some of you know. OK, so Diffie-Hellman is like whenever you use TLS, you're like, oh, I want to. I want to get some key material. I want my key material to be secret and your key material to be secret. We want to know the same keys. We're going to want some scumbag in the middle to know what that, that key, secret key material is. Uh, you do this little Diffie Hellman key exchange. So I send you a group element, you send me a group element. Woohoo! We have the same group element. Uh, and then we do a KDF. And then, boom, we more or less have TLS. Now, what is wrong with this uh, protocol diagram for Diffie Hellman key exchange? Anyone spot the terrible problem working in this diagram? No assumption. Say again? No assumption. Well, I mean, yeah, you can pick small groups and stuff, which we'll get back to. I can't hear you. I'm just going to assume you said what I think you said, which is it's not authenticated. So some scumbag in the middle can just intercept your group element, intercept the other guy's group element, and play them back to each other. So that he gets your key material. You don't know that he has that group element. He gives you a false one. He gets the one from here. Bingo. Bingo, so you see he changed that element, and then changes on the way back. And so any attacker in the middle, you're doing diffie helmet key exchange, just like the basic way we do key setup for secure protocols, can basically, if you don't authenticate it, you just sit there in the middle, intercept those group elements, and he has your key material. Right? So, so crypto protocols, which and that's like, you know, that's like the simplest one in the book, basically, are really hard to do right. And in order to do it right, you have to do a bunch of really tricky stuff, right? So you need to really find you to hash the messages. Got to make sure they're authenticated, which in the symmetric world we do with Max. Uh, you know, sign all of that as well. It, you know, it's non-trivial to fix crypto protocols, and it's non-trivial to even detect the attacks. And when you get even slightly complicated, it becomes more or less impossible. So TLS, which has been running for 20 years has basically had you know, tons of different versions. And in every version, there's been some sort of fatal attack, including fatal attacks discovered 
via model checking and formal verification up to last year, right? So this is, we're not even talking about high-tech new splitting contracts that no one's looked at before with complex re-entrancy issues. We're talking about Diffie-Hellman key exchange, okay, which is not complicated at all. And, you know, part of the problem is, uh, which is something that very few people do, but which should be done, is you have to specify your security goals. Again, for TLS, pretty trivial, right? You don't want some guy to inject data into your secure channel. And it has to be encrypted. It has to be secret, confidential. You shouldn't be able to distinguish one TLS encrypted channel from another TLS encrypted channel. So it's pretty straightforward, in theory. In practice, protocol's a mess. So first, you have to do some negotiation because you're gonna, you, know, you have this problem all over the place with Bitcoin and Ethereum. What version are people using? And along with that version, because crypto has changed over time, particularly recently, moving to the curve crypto, what cipher suite are people using? And then let's go back to those Diffie Hellman groups. What, diff, what group elements do you support? Then once you've negotiated the first part, then you basically do the thing we just talked about, the authenticated key exchange, where you verify everyone is who they think they are. And unfortunately, this relies on the rather centralized CA system. And then, boom, you're finished. You have a transcript. You check each other's transcripts. And you can send over as much JavaScript as you want. Um, but that may have its own problems, but that's the, uh, that's the next step. So this is how many attacks that has had over the last few years. Literally, not renewing initialization vector, keystream biases, insecure assumption, no state machine. The export grade attack, which we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a bit. Bad signatures, I mean, it's amazing, right? Every year, there's been new attacks discovered because the crazy thing is, this thing was running the web for 20 years and no one had really bothered to analyze it, much less give the state machine or functional specification or look very carefully at the crypto. And so we're gonna go over really quickly uh, one of the attacks, uh, which is small prime groups. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, talking about the Diffie Hellman key exchange here, which we have the first example, and you know, you want to uh, have the shared secret, which is your session key. You want to compute this, and one of the problems is that you know it has to be kind of big, right? Because actually, what we've seen is over the last few years, attacks on discrete log has been getting, uh, for the computation records, getting bigger and bigger and better. So these are these sort of field attacks. And so you really gotta, you can't choose like kind of small primes. You gotta choose nice big prime groups. Now, uh, we can see that that really simple attack uh, that we thought, you know, everyone should be able to see with authenticated uh, Diffie Hellman just repeats itself out of, out of the blue in actual TLS up until like last year, right? So, <laughs> But what happened is that when you do your initial uh, client hello, um, so this is the man in the middle, this is the evil attacker, this is your web browser, this is the server, you're like, hey, I'm gonna use a nice, a nice sort of big group. Look at that group, 2048, isn't that a nice big group? We can't be able to break key off that. The man in the middle, because that first step, client hello in group size choosing, is not authenticated, the attacker can literally just strip out the big group, send the small group over. And then, as far as the, uh, the, the client knows, as far as the server knows, I just got a small group. He sends one back, and as far as the client, she's like, oh, well, the server doesn't take big groups, so I take small groups. Oh, well, that's what I'm going to go with. <coughs> so then, he basically, oh, Yeah, I've been man in the middle myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Luckily, my, my, my wallet is on, on a random machine. But uh, anyways, regardless of that manual attack that I just suffered from, then you basically, you know, boom, send your, your, your group element back from that prime group. And the 
man in the middle, you say, oh, you got that. Zooms it back, takes that, basically, so he has, so remember, the, the, the client, the server got the, is, doesn't have, only, set, only got the small group, and therefore, the client thinks, oh, it only supports the small group, and therefore, that way, and this is just doing the negotiation stage, an attacker can basically force a downgrade attack so everyone just uses small groups. And once you've chosen, this is the attacker can more or less choose a small group, then the attacker can basically do these attacks that we just mentioned on those small groups. You can see that uh, this one would work, for example, or even slightly newer, more high-tech attacks. And boom, then the attacker can break, get your session key, and then intercept all your JavaScript code, right? So that's really amazing. And that attack existed up until very recently. It's a combination of two hard problems. And they're very different problems. They can be solved different ways by using call verification. Uh, one problem is, dear God, the client hello and the cypher suite negotiation isn't authenticated. So that's what we just saw at the beginning. That's a protocol level problem. That problem would not exist if you had some sort of authentication going on, as we saw in the Sigma protocol. The second issue is a cryptographic flaw, which is this sort of small group size. This allows the security property, which is essentially secrecy, to be broken. So you see we're breaking authenticity in the first step, and we're breaking secrecy in the second step. And dear God, the combination of those two steps, two steps means that all your JavaScript belongs to whoever's in the middle. So, okay, so, ah, oh, this is terrible. How can the web have been broken so badly for 20 years and no one even noticed? Well, luckily we can notice. So, historically, when you want to discover the security of a protocol, you can hire a cryptographer. And that will take months of work. He does what's called a security reduction, where he basically takes your protocol, looks at it for a long time, writes security proofs for people who like, for example, uh, Cardano. We now have the, uh, it's not as cool as Casper, but Ouroboros has security proofs for their proof of stake network. So that, that took a very talented cryptographer, Agnes Kiaias, many months to do by hand. However, often you do manual security proofs because people have done manual security proofs for TLS. You don't notice little tiny mistakes, like the small uh, small group size mistakes, because you think, oh, no one would bother to do that. It just doesn't occur to you when you're writing the proof by hand. So in that case, you need to use mechanized provers. So these proofs, they do proofs under the computational model. Uh, we have to sort of, you know, say, oh, this is, uh, this is secret, and we know it's secret, because I can flip this bit, and the attacker has only some negligible sort of probability of distinguishing these two random bit streams. So that's the Shopping Goldwasser style proofs. And then we also have these other kinds of proofs, which is how do we make sure key material or other secrets can, can or cannot be decrypted. And for that, we have a whole other suite of tools uh, called protocol, protocol verification tools. And so the one that uh, I recommend people look at to go further deep into is Propery. And then at the end, it's like, so that, you know, this is actually really quick. This is a little bit hard. But this you know, protocol verification, can't do by hand in a few weeks. However, what is more or less impossible, which is why the uh, Mozilla is such a breakthrough, is it takes years to insert verification into code. Because basically, you may have this wonderful model of your protocol that's like really amazing. You may have all these wonderful proofs, and they can be formally verified. You can run them in Cog or Isabel or whatever crazy thing you're using. I recommend CryptoVary, maybe if you're something like EasyCrypt. Regardless, they all sort of different trade-offs. Regardless, it doesn't matter because you're not really running that model now, are you? Right? <laughs> That's the problem. You're, you're, the code that kind of hits the iron is a bunch of crazy C code, and you're just kind of proving stuff about your model of the C code. So what you really want is you want that model to run in actual code. You want formally verified, not just models, but actual code. And the, you do that via verification tools, which essentially are make specs. So we have the hack spec tool, which then the specs, the correctness of the specs can be tested against code. In this case, uh, the Microsoft Internet F Start uh, tool chain is probably the, the most interesting, although we also have COC and this program synthesis. And then from that, you can actually compile down to something like 
a safe subset of C, or even if you're crazy enough, JavaScript is the problem where that space got lost. And so again, so we're going to just go into how formal verification can fix these TLS issues. First thing, if you're like, well, what, what's the problem? Well, you have to define the problems. The simplest way to define your problems is using what's called the symbolic model. The symbolic model, you just assume crypto works. You assume your library is fine, and you just define that properties of your adversary. Your adversary would be, you know, can read or write any messages in public, can compromise some keys, but can't just sort of randomly guess the keys. And you assume crypto works. Then if you do that, you can write your security goals. So we discovered, we covered secrecy and authenticity, but there's tons of other goals you can have. You have a lack of replay, right? So you don't want messages between honest peers, can't be replayed. You can have DDoS protection. You can have forward secrecy, that even if long-term keys are leaked, messages in the, uh, can't be decrypted afterwards. And then using tools like formal verification, model checking tools, which we described earlier, you can do basic simple queries that say, can the attacker know that there's a message on this connection sent from the server where they get the, they can read that message? Can they know that message? And you say, well, if they can, then we can prove it's secure because it walks through that big state space and tests that model at every point in the state, state space using a SAT solve. So that's pretty awesome. And what that requires is that requires taking your protocol and defining a state machine for it. That's very painful, but you basically, you have to define it completely. You get the entire state diagram, which you can then write out using crypto functions. You can use, and, and you can sort of say, well, how, how big is a state machine? Well, it depends. TLS is a pretty old, gnarly protocol, which never had a state machine made for it before. It took 500 lines to write it. Uh, the threat model was 400 lines, particularly for secrecy, it was a bit tricky. And the security goal is 200 lines. We're talking about 1,100 lines of code, but it's not so bad for securing the entire web. If you model all <laughs> in probery, and boom, uh, you can basically prove that TLS 1.2 is broken, and TLS 1.3 is more or less correct. Although we do have this domain crunching problem that just came up with Signal and Amazon, where the SNI is unencrypted. So that should be fixed. And you can only you can do this for. Uh, not only can you do this for protocols, you can do this for APIs. So the crypto API, which I helped start at the W3C, basically, you know, oh wow, if a guy from Google designing it, he's really smart. And he was really smart. But, you know, in his, like, the initial example code on the API, and this was around for like a year or two before someone noticed, we were supporting broken cipher suites, which had, which were verbal to something called Lichen vectors attack, right? So you have all these attacks which snuck in to literally Google written code, written for all JavaScript developers, deployed in all browsers, and people didn't notice until someone bothered to look and run a, ran a formal analysis to really prove that it was actually broken. And at this point, I'm going to speed up here a bit. Uh, the web, you know, it's pretty broken. DRM is crept in. That's why I quit W3C, because uh, DRM is evil and you can't verify crypto unless you can actually look at it. There's huge protest against the state of the web, including you may have fixed TLS, but obviously things are going downhill within the browser itself. So this is a golden moment where we can design new protocols that can be verified. Right? So signal and everything is on my hand, but now we're having new protocols using MLS. We get threat model, security goals, well understood constructions. Break things in the sub protocols, remove or limit key reusage, and do those terrible state machines. You can do them using the following tools. If you want to make a state machine for your crypto, I highly recommend looking at this paper, Sequence of Games, a tool for gaming complexity and security proofs. This paper basically here says, well, you know, if you want to do a security proof, it's really complicated. You can break up the smaller parts. You prove each small part, and then you combine them all. And if you combine them in the right way, those properties <coughs> hold through your whole proof. And that's kind of what you can stick in a computational model. In the computation, the best tool I think for computational modeling stuff is crypto very. And then if you actually want to take that model and boil it down into tight check code using a great crazy functional programming language, compile that functional programming language down to C. F star is currently probably the best language out there for that sort of stuff. It doesn't quite support computational proofs yet, but it will soon, but it does great type checking. And then if you're interested in the symbolic model, uh, Probrief and Tamarind are there as well. 
and easy crypt if you're interested in other computational model tools. So again, tons of stuff going on in the space. So I had to kind of speed through that at the end. These are, again, lots of tools. They're all really hard to use. We're going to need companies like Quantstamp to make them better. These tools are the cutting edge of tools that were developed to fix the original boring broken web. They took 20 years to build. They're finally being deployed. Code from FSTAR is running in your Mozilla browser right now, so we know that there's no carry errors in your elliptic curves. We have formally verified elliptic curves. But then all the cool, fancy stuff that everyone's doing now, for example, LibSnarks, pairing-based crypto, we don't have any of that verified. It's probably OK. The people who design all this stuff are really intelligent. Um, that being said, it would be really great to formally verify some of those. And when you start moving to things like range proofs for Bitcoin or other crazy stuff going on, uh, we, don't, we don't really have formal models of any of that stuff. We're definitely not running formally verified code. And eventually, that could be a problem. Again, we don't know. It took 20 years for the web to find some of those issues. But if we can take the tools, remember, these tools aren't maybe perfect for Ethereum. They were developed with things like JavaScript and C and web protocols in mind. So they could probably be modified to work well with the EVM. In fact, the EVMs were already been modeled in F star, and some errors were discovered. And people are using ProBrief now to look at sort of smart contract-based systems and some new versions of Ethereum. And I think it's really important that we try to basically take the lessons that the web learned after 20 years of totally being broken and apply them to the new Ethereum ecosystem. So sorry for the speed up at the end. Hope that was interesting. That's all we've learned, 20 years and 20 minutes. Uh, don't make the same errors. So, um, thanks, uh, thanks to all the uh, speakers. Uh, we try to, try to get uh, uh, some range of different uh, formal verification uh, perspectives. So, I'm Peter from the Web3 Foundation, uh, and I will, I will talk a bit uh, about. Uh, um, wrong font. Oh well. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I will speak a little bit about uh, about Web3 uh, more more widely, uh, about uh, a little bit about the Web3 Foundation, uh, and uh, kind of uh, how we see moving towards Web3. Uh, uh, but first, uh, and that so generally the, the Web3 Foundation has been established to to uh, to help bring uh, Web3 to life. Uh, we do a number of different uh, kind of initiatives uh, to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, the, in order to first maybe understand better uh, what is uh, Web3 or why we would want to go uh, towards it, uh, I think it's important to understand uh, uh, what has been wrong with, with previous systems. Uh, there are many different speakers kind of uh, expressed it in, in different ways. Uh, but uh, but when it uh, in the in the current systems, the current centralized systems, we we usually uh, rely when when there is a lot of users, we rely on some central party to coordinate the interactions between them and uh, coordinate uh, how they uh, how they work together, uh, and that of course introduces the either either uh, uh, fragility in the system, so the system can be prom compromised by, by compromising the central point, uh, or the central party can start to uh, exercise uh, or pricing uh, uh, on, on its users. Uh, so on the other hand, even if the system works correctly, like a, like a big bank, most of the time the, the transfer goes through correctly, there is a huge overhead associated with making sure that it actually is correct. So. There is auditor, there are auditors, there are, there are regulators that need to all look at the, at, the, at the simple database that just keeps track of balances to ensure that it's uh, working correctly. And this, this trickles down as, as uh, different types of costs and, uh, uh, and overhead for, for any users of the system. Uh, and 
So, so really, with with Web three, what we want to bring about is uh, is we want some we want some way to, to make it make it simpler, make those interactions simpler, right? uh, uh, and and more direct, so that we don't have to have those uh, drawbacks of a centralized system. Uh, and uh, we want to those Web three protocols or those technologies that we are talking about. Those are various types of technologies. That enable us to to, uh, uh, to uh, set up those clear, clear rules for uh, uh, interaction and, and uh, building efficient uh, markets and collaboration between users. Uh, so uh, we want to we want to achieve. There is there is lots of different hopes in the Web three space, but in order to to kind of actually bring it about, we need to think about. Uh, what what are the needs of developers that need to be fulfilled in order to build those decentralized applications that will fulfill those promises? So uh, let's say we want to have a globally used decentralized Uber or a globally used decentralized application uh, as as part of uh, as uh, part of the infrastructure of our interactions. Uh, and in order to build an application like that, uh, uh, you require lots of different. So you might need to store your files somewhere that are currently being stored on a centralized server, and now you want to store it in a, in a more decentralized manner. You might want to uh, you might want to exchange value or, or have some sort of reputation. Okay, in the case of the centralized Uber, it's part of, of driver reputation or user reputation. Uh, maybe blockchain could be good for that. Uh, but then you might also want some sort of transient communication. So you might want to announce, for instance, hey, I want to take a ride now from here to there. And you don't probably don't want to record it forever on the blockchain, but you still need some sort of protocol that would support this capability. Uh, and there is many different needs that 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 that, a, that an application developer uh, uh, might have. Sometimes, sometimes some applications will require some secrets to be stored. So you don't want anything, everything in the open. So. In order to really, really bring about those widely used decentralized applications, we need to we need to make sure that that we support, supply all the different capabilities to, to an application developer. So once we kind of are roughly familiar with what the what the needs are in order to build this decentralized application, we can think of how to break it down into into a into a set of protocols that will supply those capabilities. So this is just one one way to break it down. Uh, there is uh, on the on the bottom layer we need we need the different peers on the on the network to connect to each other, uh, to, uh, to communicate, uh, to find each other. And this is where the peer to peer overlay comes in. And there is uh, right right now for instance uh, Ethereum uses dev P2P um, uh, and most of the protocols use their own kind of custom peer to peer layer. But we could we could also have a more generic peer to peer layer that, that is reused across different different uh, protocols. So one one uh, one peer to peer uh, uh, networking layer, lib P two P, is much more generic than, than than some of the existing ones. So we can we can try to design our protocols to make use of lib P two P no matter uh, no matter what they do on top of it. Uh, we we want some. On some blockchains or some something to perform computation or keep track of, uh, uh, make sure that there is some trustless computation being performed. So that can help you with, with having currencies, with having reputation, with having all those systems that are currently built, uh, being built on, on Ethereum. Uh, you might want to distribute some data. So here we have things like Swarm or IPFS. Um, uh, you might want to keep some secrets. So there, there is like new cipher or, or, or RET secret store and a few other uh, approaches. Um, and uh, um, send data in a transit manner. So basically not record something on the chain, but, but just announce something. And this is where protocols like uh, Whisper uh, 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 come in. Um, and then on top, of, on top of all of those different technologies, so let's say if you run this decentralized Uber on, on your phone, uh, you want to you want to make sure that those those technologies are all kind of work underneath, and and uh, and uh, when you write a particular application, you have some set of APIs that enable you to access capabilities of each of those technologies. So then we need to design some APIs and languages. Currently, most APIs uh, 
protocol, for instance, plug into just a single protocol. So let's say Web3.js would be plugged just into, into the blockchain part, and then you would need to use something else for, for, for file storage. But ideally, we create a small developer experience that enables people to leverage all the different bits. Uh, there might be special languages that are used to develop things uh, on top of those protocols. And then we need some way to display it to the user or distribute it. So here there is lots of projects that are uh, usually focused mostly uh, on the blockchain part, but, but for instance, applications like uh, Status also enable uh, usage of, of Whisper and, and uh, some other um, uh, some other kind of browsers start to enable uh, uh, usage of IPFS or other other uh, bits and pieces. And we'll need to make sure that those things are enabled because otherwise, for instance, protocols like Akasha, they have to they have to make their own native application that that. Uh, um, that kind of bundles in all those different things rather than having like a nice um, browser where basically all those capabilities are exposed. Uh, and, uh, and, and you like, you, it's pretty obvious that, that some of those technologies are being developed faster, some of them slower. There are different stages of development. There are some pretty good teams already tackling some of those pieces. But really, in order to, to push the whole thing forward, we need to we need to ensure that those things are done and they will work well together. Uh, so, uh, how how might we kind of select, select different technologies or, or try to uh, have some sort of criteria to make sure that that, that, uh, that the technologies we are kind of using for our web three technologies like are, are good. So they need to fulfill our needs. So, for instance, if we have a blockchain, it has to have some capability of running on the on top of the if it's one requirement that, that this enterprise application should be working on mobile devices, we need to have a, let's say, a lifetime protocol that can be used, that can be used uh, on, a, on a home or uh, they need, there has to be some protocol that provides uh, file storage and provides it in such a way that this actually fulfills the needs of the developer. Uh, in order to be pragmatic and actually uh, uh, be, be sure that, that we deliver something sooner than later and it will be of good quality, we can we can of course have a look at the at the team and, and how likely they are there to succeed. Maybe we can help them in some way by by sharing with them uh, uh, resources of of, uh, uh, of other teams in order for them to, to achieve uh, their goal. Um, uh, another very important point is how uh, how does how much does the given technology reuse other standard uh, web three text stack components? So uh, when we when we are Making this uh, this stack of protocols, like we don't want every single network maybe to use a different peer-to-peer -peer networking layer because then every single protocol has different peers, as a as an additional uh, piece of code that has to be running and and uh, uh, or, uh, and uh, that the executable gets big. There is more computation that has to be done. Uh, improvements to the peer-to-peer -peer networking don't propagate across the different stack components. So it's important that, that all those technologies kind of work uh, well together. Oh. Um, uh, we we should of course also be uh, like aware of the of the speed of progress of a particular development of a particular thing. There is lots of kind of very long term uh, Web three technologies that that maybe maybe will arrive uh, in, in, uh, in two years or, or longer. But we should we should uh, we try to have either some sort of roadmap to, uh, that, that enables people to develop things right now because otherwise we'll stall and no one will be able to develop their applications um, uh, and, uh, and propose some existing solutions. Um, and of course, the, ideally we get everyone to work together and engage with each other to, uh, to, to make those protocols uh, And um, kind of uh, to, to uh, so to, to kind of like according to those to those different criteria, I think I think for instance uh, currently, uh, um, let's say let's say what, what what we try to do is try to figure out a, uh, if if an application needs to use a blockchain, but currently blockchain doesn't have enough throughput. What are the different ways we can get enough throughput right now? So uh, uh, we we try to try to find solutions like uh, like state channels and try to make them as usable as possible or side chains. Uh, so that so that we can accelerate uh, the deployment of the centralized applications, or we try to uh, uh, get some research done in order to, to get Whisper to a state where it's more usable than it is right now. So 
not many projects could rely on Whisper, mm -hmm. like state channels or, or uh, other types of projects, but right now they either have to roll their own communication protocol or they rely on more uh, centralized tools. Um, so there is lots of research to be done, and there are different, different fields that are uh, uh, need to be developed. Uh, ideally, ideally, this research is not being done in a kind of general manner. Rather, rather we can figure out for each of the stack technology stack components, we figure out what are the additional pieces of, of, uh, of tech or research that we need in order to get them to a usable state, and then get it done from there. Uh, and, and we need to partner with, uh, we need to a community of, of uh, research groups and, and core technology teams to develop their protocols and applications, uh, application builders to kind of uh, uh, acknowledge that there is this web technology stack and that, that they, they should drive towards getting some sort of usable base <coughs> layer, not only for themselves, but, but also for others. So we need to work all together to, to uh, uh, to make sure that there is a solid base uh, in place. Uh, and and uh, another way through, through which we can kind of uh, get a lot of those things done is through different ecosystem support funds. So, so uh, things like uh, your community funds and other types of funds are just with us. Um, so at the Web3 Foundation, we are looking for different kinds of contributors. Uh, uh, if, if you are interested and in not uh, want to just work with us in one way or another. Uh, we are looking for uh, developers, researchers, educators, uh, community helpers in order to, uh, to bring it uh, a little bit uh, more forward. Uh, so we can find out more and hopefully participate in the discussion about those uh, protocols. Uh, you can have a look at Reddit, uh, reddit.com slash r slash web3, uh, uh, our website. Um, you can also find out more about uh, one of the bigger protocols we support, which is Polkadot, uh, that, that helps with interoperability between different chains and potentially um, securing them all together. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thanks.